Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome to Fall, the first fall episode of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here in the fall, wherever you may be. I'm your host, the great Brian Last, and here he is, the man who's going to save the show this week, the star of the show, Mr. Jim Cornette. Morning, Brian. Well, afternoon. Well, it's morning somewhere. It's always afternoon in Hawaiian Brian time. The people are probably going to be in mourning that they spent a few hours of their lives with us today. I'll tell you, boy, howdy, I'll tell you what. Um, no, boy, mourning Brian, I, have I ever told you that story? Is that Bob Roop? That's Bob Roop, Droopy Roop. When we went to Georgia for Crockett, Atlanta, that three months in the summer of 1985 before they moved us up to Charlotte, Roop was still there, and we would go on those goddamn miserable trips up to West Virginia and Ohio that wasn't drawing 15 cents in Chinese money at that point in time. And we'd be in Wheeling, West Virginia. We'd be in Charleston was a great town, but not then. And Roop was on those trips, and you'd see him in the lobby of the hotel every morning. Hey, Bob, good morning. Morning, boys. And he always had that hangdog expression. And we started in the car amongst ourselves, not to the Olympic bronze medalist face or whatever the fuck he was. We would call him Droopy Roop. Morning, boys. You know, there's a lot of people that think if 1975 had lasted another 10 years, he would have been a much bigger star. That's true. And he would have, because he was a... It, for Florida and that period of time, he was perfect. But then, you know, I think he, he started thinking he was smarter than he was and tried to steal everybody's territory. And there you go. Was, Speaking of the... I was trying to what, help what, everyone. I was just doing oh, it to he, help everyone yeah. else. He was trying to help everyone into his new territory that he had stolen. <laughs> But speaking of the crime report, let's go. Do you know who got arrested, Brian? Do you know who got arrested? Who got arrested? Uh, is it Somebody's been arrested. They have been, they've been taken into custody. They've been cuffed and stuff. They've been taken downtown. They've been put into the crossbar hotel. They're boarding with the warden, living on the bounty of the county. Guess who? And if I just have to guess based on everything we talk about, um... Teddy Hart, or a Hardy, or the other Hardy. No. Brooks Houck has been arrested by the FBI, no less. Aren't you happy about this? Who is this Houck? He's Ma and Paul Houck's son. And he's been arrested for the disappearance of Crystal Rogers. Certainly, a this has made national news. It's not just the biggest story here in town. They had a, rem a live remote on the morning news this, this morning of one of the TV reporters in the car on the way to the courthouse just saying, they arrested him. I'm in the car now. Stay tuned. That's big enough. Certainly even the national news has protruded into the the dullards up there in northern New Jersey. Yeah, we get a lot of national... All the news is being disseminated from up here next to the dullards of New Jersey. Most of well, us newscasters live here in the dullards of New Jersey. You can inseminate the news up there later on all you want, but anyway, no, Crystal Rogers disappeared off the face of the earth eight years ago here in suburban Louisville, Kentucky. They found her car on the side of the road with all her shit in it, She's never been seen again. The prime suspect the whole time has been her boyfriend at the time, the last person to see her alive, Brooks Houck. And they have been trying to get this guy for eight years. The FBI has been involved in it. They, they dug up this guy's backyard with steam shovels. Then they went and they dug up a driveway of I think of a business owned by his parents. Then they dug up a whole goddamn place that was built by a construction company owned by his family. They have dug up half a goddamn Kentucky looking for clues. And then a couple weeks ago, they arrested a guy for conspiracy to commit murder 
that we'd never heard this fucking guy's name before. And then all of a sudden, after the FBI and after the family's been on the goddamn news for years saying, he did it, we know he did it, they finally arrested him this morning. And he don't look happy. $10 million bond in Shepherdsville, Kentucky. They said, the, the people at the courthouse said, we've never heard of that amount of a bond before around here. This is fucking crazy. All right, so this is the happy talk portion of the show. Well, I'm t- well a lot of people are happy about this around here. Are you happy? Well, yes. He's looked like a weasel since the first time I saw him on the news. Do you like it when weasels are the ones who get busted? Well, it depends on if, if it was Weasel Dooley, I wouldn't, I wouldn't like that, you know. But if, it, if it's a deserving weasel who has weaseled their way into that weasel moniker dishonestly by being a, a real weasel, then those weasels ought to get fucking goozled. Other than Weasel Dooley. Goozle a weasel today. Other than Weasel Dooley, name one babyface weasel. There are none. Even if Bobby Heenan was a baby face to us, but to the people, he was still a weasel. But anyway, that's a crime rate. You know what else is going on? I'll tell you, here's some happy talk for you. You know what's back on television? No. Kitchen Nightmares. Oh, how can I miss you if I've never heard of you? Uh, no, 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 come on. You weren't a faithful weekly watcher and taper and dvr of of the tv series kitchen nightmares starring the incomparable gordon ramsay my favorite united kingdom and my favorite of the blonde chefs who yell at people with an accent no i don't i don't watch the original one he's the best at it i don't really I'm the not really into the uh, fucking gourmet didn't cuss anybody. That was his problem. The galloping gourmet, the alcohol was the star. Once the chefs became like, you know, we're stars. I kind of, I'm not really into the culinary shows as much. Well, you would thought the galloping gourmet as fucking sauced as he got fucking cooking on the show. He'd be cussing some people, but he was still too. He was a happy drunk. Until he had that but, stroke, and then he came back, and he couldn't gallop anymore of it. Well, you remember he that when he was, and he was drooping and yeah. not he was drinking, but not drooping, but not drinking. It's the only thing sadder than Floyd the Barber's return was the Gourmet's oh. return. <laughs> Howard McNear, because he couldn't stand. He had to sit in the chair or lean on something, or you shot him from the waist up. But we're digressing here. The point is, Kitchen Nightmares at Gordon Ramsay. That's where I was going. Yeah, I can't believe you didn't watch that program. Because so people close to me, including my lovely wife, Stacy, have said many times that it, it was like watching me in a locker room when he was in the fucking kitchen or the, the goddamn walk-in freezer. Y'all kill somebody! But it, it, the, the show has been off the air for, for years now. And I was a faithful watcher, and they canceled that. But they kept on Gordon Ramsay's search to find the greatest fucking taco chef in the world. And Gordon Ramsay put him in a fucking RV like the Lex Express. They were lugering him across America with a portable kitchen. They had all these different concepts. And boom, boom, boom. They're not just hit, not hitting the bullseye. They're going all the way off the fucking target for me. I don't want to see budding great chefs trained. I don't want to see amateur chefs found. I don't want to see anything other than Gordon Ramsay in the goddamn kitchen of a restaurant telling these motherfuckers in no uncertain terms how to modify their behavior. And now it's back. And he's why was it, it gone? So, why was it gone so long? I don't know. He still had umpteen shows out in various incarnations, but he wasn't doing Kitchen Nightmare. They, he did a, a, the Cafe Hun. In Baltimore in 2010, no, 2011, no, yes, 2011, when Sinclair bought Ring of Honor and we started doing the TV post-production in Baltimore at their station overnight from 7 p.m. to fucking 5.30 a.m., 
that shaved years off my life. But it, 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 I've mentioned that that station was in, the best way you can describe it is the fucking mecca of crack neighborhoods, and the only thing really close, and you didn't have to drive a couple miles to get was a McDonald's on the corner. But if you drove a couple miles, which we started doing early on, and then quit because we didn't have fucking time because we were constantly posting that fucking show, but I digress. We would buzz over to the Cafe Hun and get some takeout and bring it back to the station. And then we go over there one time and it's all boarded up and it's closed. And there's tape. I thought it was a crime scene. Tape around the fucking sidewalk. They're shooting kitchen nightmares there. And it actually aired. The, the, the alleged story was that the the woman who owned Cafe Hun, H-O-N, because like, how you doing, hun? That's a Baltimore thing, apparently. And she had trademarked it. And the whole area was pissed off at her because she trademarked their... It's like, you know, if you went to New York City to Manhattan and trademarked, hey, fuck you, I'm walking here, you know. So they renovated the place, and we liked the food beforehand, and. We enjoyed watching from afar as Gordon Ramsay walked in and out of his fucking trailer. But then we went there afterwards and the place looked a little better, but goddamn food was worse. But he had already been gone by then. You still watch Bar Rescue? Yeah, well, it was off for a couple years because there was no way to rescue the bars during the pandemic. But now it's back on. But I sense that he is in some cases, tried to become a kindler, gentler John Taffer because he's going for more of the, or at least he was in the early part of the new episodes reoccurring, more of the heartwarming stories of how they were victimized by the pandemic through no fault of their own. But I think I've seen a couple that indicates he may be getting back to just tongue-lashing motherfuckers that are stupid and can't figure out how to fix their fucking raw sewage. I like that better. Could it work for wrestling? No. Because then, <laughs> to not ruin the concept of the show, the promotion, whichever one was being nightmared, would have to get better. And I don't really see a promotion where any one man or potentially even team of individuals might be able to accomplish a, a significant turnaround in any legitimate period of time <laughs> this week john taffer and gordon ramsay return to impact for the 15th week in a row <laughs> will they make any progress this time oh see that's a, they're in there like three days they're in and out they're training the fucking bartenders how to pour some drinks they're training some dip shit how to fry burgers and and they're put in a pos system those piece of shit systems and then and then they're gone my work here is done and then later on, you see, well, their income rose 20%. Well, from zero, zilch, they were losing fucking money. It, that probably ain't hard, but you're still not turning a sow's ear into a fucking silk purse in the wrestling business in, in a week. You bring people in there. I want to show you what we did. We have a curtain put up. You pull it up. <laughs> new aprons, new aprons, <laughs> new ropes. <laughs> New turnbuckle pads. Look at the color of these seats. You see these? These are our proprietary yeah. seats. Proprietary you can only buy them from us <laughs> going forward. And uh, Jim's going to go work with Tony in the back. Teach him how to book in two days. And uh, well, now you're talking about more like Marlon Perkins and Jim on Wild Kingdom. I'll sit in the back while Jim goes out and wrangles Tony Khan. See, would an AEW show be better like Wild Kingdom? Like you're watching from afar and learning yes. about the wildlife? <laughs> Telephoto lenses? Now, <laughs> don't make me laugh, motherfucker. Now, if you'll be very quiet, you'll see that the plumber and the lucha gymnast are about to execute the aggressive parkour. That, oh, wait, there's been a mistake. He's dropped him on his head. No, he's back up. You see the little lion named Sammy <laughs> carefully, quietly walking backstage, avoiding. Anyone who wants to smack him in the mouth. <laughs> Actually, he's a panda. Remember, he's a panda. 
I don't know. I kind of saw him as a little like lion. No, remember cub. he actually used to wear a. Oh, no, I know. Yeah. I think he was miscast. Is what I'm oh. saying. There's he nothing mis- panda like about him. He was mischaracterized. He's pandaing to the audience. <laughs> <He's-> <laughs> <laughs> If that he is, that he is. That he is. Clearly we're not, but he is. <laughs> Would this be a good time for me to bring up the uh, JimCornette.com Cornette's Collectibles holiday season sale real quickly? Of course. Well, I'll do that then. Folks, it's this coming Saturday, October the 7th at noon Eastern time. We've been talking for the past month about the pre-orders that have been ongoing of the Midnight Express 40th anniversary action figure set of all four of us for the first and last time ever. And by the way, now there are less than 800 people in the world who are going to have the chance to own one of those fine bad boys along with the complete package, the full color book, the certificate of authenticity, and the autographed 8 by 10 because that's how many we got left. But during the period of time that we have been pre orders uh, putting those up for pre-order, we had taken down all the other merchandise to concentrate on that. And by the way, if you have already ordered, pre-ordered that is, the Feather Bottoms have already packed and sent out early, I might add, the first hundred boxes and almost all of the little over a thousand with 1,200 pictures have been signed and personalized and are ready to go and they're packing away as we speak. But... On Saturday, October 7th, all of the other merchandise that we normally sell comes back around. We concentrated on the midnight figures in September. Now, October 7th and through the holidays, uh, the Cornette face shirts, the DVDs, the autographed pictures, the Cult of Cornette membership certificates that apparently you can't get in the Cult of Cornette Facebook group without. It makes it greases the wheels a little bit, from what I understand. All that stuff is going back up for sale, so order with impunity. Nobody will come to your home and slap you about the head and face if you spend all your money for all your friends on your various Christmas lists right there at jimcornette.com. Except for Brooks Hout, because he's in jail. All right. Well, that was the... Uh... Well, boy, you're a happy son of a bitch here today. Well, you're not giving me much to transition to. Let's go from arrested murderers what? to... <laughs> Murder? WWE, who murders TV. No, um, you watched some stuff. I didn't. There's other things I did watch, but we're not going to make this a review-heavy show. <laughs> you went back, I know, after the fact... And watch the collision match between Brian Danielson and Ricky Starks, the Texas Death Match. Yes. Was it because you saw all the social media stuff about the chair shot? Well, I'll be glad to tell you you're wrong, but in this particular instance, you're not. Um, yeah, I had to. My curiosity was piqued, as they say, and that's P I C Q U E D, not the peaked as in Pike's Peak. I I hate when people make that mistake. But nevertheless, it came up on Twitter the morning of the, uh, or the morning after the show, or maybe even that night, I wasn't standing by, that Ricky Starks and Brian Danielson, and they had a, what they call a Texas death match, right? It's a last man standing match. And because there's no multiple falls and blah, 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 it's basically whoever gets knocked down and can't get up by a count of 10, which is a last man standing match. But Tony still thinks the name is cool to the point where the announcer, even Kevin Kelly, they had to be feeding him this, making him say it. Where, well, Dory Funk Sr. established this, the name of the match, yes, but not this match. Anyway, the clip went out of Starks. He's working on Danielson's leg. And he, you know, as it wrapped around the ring post while Danielson's laying on his back in the ring, like you, like you yank the guy's leg around the post, except he goes and gets a chair to Starks and draws back. And there's the leg on the post. And Danielson ain't moving. He's selling. He's, he's right there. And he fucking whacked the ring post above the leg so far, so obviously, so whatever that, Danielson sold it because he was expecting the shot. 
But I think as he reacted to it and then realized it didn't come anywhere close to him that he he kind of he didn't roll all the way across the ring with it. He was going, oh God, I'm selling that. And there was not only this was a fan cam of, you know, somebody with a cell phone shot of the chair shot, and it was going around on Twitter where it was just it was so bad, so obvious. And I'm thinking. Was there was there any excuse for this? Like the shot that they had on their television program was okay because of the camera angle. It looked like it killed him, but just for the where were the Grand Rapids for the three or four thousand people in attendance, you could see it from the cheap seats. At least that's what they said in the dirt sheets. But then I had to watch the TV match to find out, and I did. And Brian, did you watch that match? I had Collision on in the background live as it aired, but I didn't pay specific attention to it. Right. But I watched some of this match because of who was in it. Well, but did you watch, did you see the angle, the camera angle of that particular spot that I just described on their show? I didn't remember it, you know, as it happened. I didn't see anything until I saw the clips going around on social media. Then I well, it didn't look any better on their shot than it did on the fan cam. It would, you could almost hear at least one of the announcers kind of go like, ah, that's the kind of thing. If in OVW, I would throw my fucking pin that I always had in my right hand. I'd throw it down on the desk and Dean Hill would back up a little bit farther away from me in case I blew. But I love Brian Danielson. He's one of the best. My only complaint about Brian is he is such a nice guy and wants to cooperate with everybody and is one of the people, honestly, who think, oh, there's so many styles of wrestling that he will risk his special talent that he has in the ring as an in-ring wrestler, babyface, people get behind he has the fucking in-ring matches, the not just the moves and the technical, but the psychology and the, the whole nine yards. But he will also participate in the fucking hardcore, the garbage match, the 10-man football field fuckery, the what, whatever the fuck, right? It doesn't look like he says no to... He, he, he let him stick him in the group with Moxley... So he doesn't take great care of himself the way he's presented, but I love him. And we like Starks. But the whole match, because then I was, I had to see the thing from start to finish because I thought, okay, maybe this was a brilliant match with one, you know, unfortunate fucking bleh. I don't think it was a brilliant match. I think the last four minutes that I was able to see were probably really good because that's when they actually got in the ring. And I understand they wanted to have a fight. They want a Texas death match is wild. It's a brawl. There's personal issues here. They brought Jim Ross in to do color. And so they jump-started it and got in a fight but they immediately, they go to the floor. They go over the rail into the, into the arena, in the crowd. And that's where the announcers were talking about Dory Sr. making the, they made the name of the match famous. But they went into the stands. Then they went to the back of the arena. Then they went to a different part of the back of the arena. And they're doing the long fight walk from place to place, and then they do their business, and they go on. It's like Brody and Abdullah, Abdullah. Brody and Abdullah did. Abdullah, yeah. Well, Brody and Abdullah did, but you saw that live, and you only saw it, like, probably once. You didn't see it every goddamn... Uh. Anyway, so when they get back to ringside, Starks throws Danielson over the railing, into the front row of the other side where there's a bunch of indie guys there to catch him. And then here comes some security guys. And then as they're trying to pull Danielson out of the front row, Starks dives off the top rope onto all of them. And uh, 
So I started, I hit the fast forward button. I said, I'm going to see how long it takes them to get in the ring. And as soon as I hit the button, they went to break. That was their break spot. And believe it or not, in the picture in picture, they finally got back in the ring. But by the time they came back from the break, they were on the floor again. And now there's a whole nother set. And that's where the, the chair spot that we talked about came in. The fan cam obviously exposed it, and you could tell that the people in the building had seen it, and there wasn't like a big ooh. It was more like an, a muted hmm. And their camera angle wasn't any better because you could see through that one. But then it became a long thing where it, Starks is getting heat on Danielson with the chair. And then, you know, choking him with it. And if you're standing there over a fucking guy with a chair in your hand, just beat him like Paul Bunyan until his brains are jelly, right? You don't have to think of different ways to do things with a fucking chair. And then he tried the pillman on the ankle off the top rope, but by the time he got up there, Danielson was up and just starts belaboring him with the fucking chair. And... Again, maybe by this point, this would have been good if any of the first five or eight minutes had been in the ring. But it just, it, uh, and Danielson made a comeback and got people up and then went for the knee and then Starks nailed him with the fucking chair again. And as the heel nails the fucking baby face with chair and he goes down, the fans start chanting, We want tables. Now, unless they, wouldn't they at least be chanting, we want an ambulance, we want a doctor, we want medical attention for Brian Danielson, our hero. Not, now that you hit him with a chair, put him through a piece of furniture. It's not about the wrestler, it's about the fans. So then we have another break. And then we we came back and I noted, well, they've got less than five minutes on the fucking air. And now Starks, apparently in the break, has had a logging chain wrapped around his fist. And he's trying to punch Danielson with it, but he dropped it and they started slapping each other. Which looked actually better than if you try to punch somebody with a logging chain wrapped around your fucking fist. Because not only are you going to kill them if it looks any good at all, but you're going to break your fucking knuckle. When did they go from the heel pulls a chain out of his tights? It's a dog choker chain. The people can see the links. It's shiny. You wrap it around. Bam! Hit the baby face, you're done, too. It's got to be 10 feet long with links as big as goddamn tennis balls. So anyway, but at that point, they they uh, Starks wrapped the chain around Danielson's neck and cranked it up and then let go of him so he could be counted, but he beat the count. So then Starks got the old over-the-shoulder hangman with the chain. And Danielson flipped out, but Starks went to spear him, but Danielson rolled through with the LaBelle lock and then got the chain and wrapped it around Starks. Starks fought out. They're on their knees. Starks has a chair. Danielson comes with the knee. Starks puts it up like he's going to hit him. Danielson hits the chair with the knee and drives it into Starks' face and busts him open hard way. And then my DVR froze up because the fucking time of the show was over. So what happened? I don't specifically remember. <laughs> I thought Danielson won again, but now you're making me question that because you... No, I know he won, but I think he choked him out with... Sir yeah, Bull I mean, but I wasn't really into it. It was too... You know, I didn't like the first match. Everyone raved about it. You raved about it. The... Uh, was it a chain match? No, what was it? It was a strap match. No, uh, yeah. Yes, the chain match was not. It was a strap match because of the dragon, Ricky the right. dragon. And, and that was the time. first match those two had ever had, or at least as part of this program, because it was going to be Starks and Punk, and Punk right. had his issues and wasn't there. So now it was him and Danielson. This is the second match they've had. So the first match is a strap match. <laughs> the second match, the Texas death match, doing all the things everyone else does in every other match. It's not just the high spots. It's not just the, excuse me, the off the top rope high spots mm -hmm. that are overdone. 
everything that used to be a rarity is now done every episode and sometimes in every match to the point where fans like me, it just doesn't register anymore. I'm going to say the same thing I said last time. I really didn't like this match. It just didn't do it for me. I'm agreeing with you on this one. It just, again, more of the same stuff, but when you've got a guy like Danielson who excels in the ring, what is the need to have him out in a fucking popcorn stand? It... What's the need in beating Starks twice? Starks is the one who needs to get over more, not Danielson. Well, I can't. Maybe he choked him. Well, actually, after that chair to the head, because right when the DVR froze up, the announcer just said, oh, Starks is busted open, and he had just come into camera frame, and you see his spurt of blood going down the side of his head. I think he opened up his eyebrow. It may have been Starks said, like Moxley the other day, fuck it, just beat me. Don't hurt me anymore. Well, I don't think it was that. Please, baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Now you're singing garbage songs? Now you're just going right to the crap? Look at my blood. Baby, don't hurt me. Don't hurt me. No more. Did you like this song when you used to go to the clubs? Uh, All the time I was clubbing. It was a a big thing. I could see that being a big thing in the 80s. The guy shows up looking like the... Nerd, you know? That was the era of the nerd. <laughs> I didn't, the only way I would have showed up at a club in the 80s is if I'd had a goddamn gorilla mask on because of people to recognize me, they would have disemboweled me. Well, maybe you would have gone to a club in the 80s if you were a little more relaxed. Maybe if you had a good night's sleep the night before and you felt a little more relaxed and in your groove on that moment. In my groove on that moment? On that day. Just like Stella, you can get your groove back and... Go the clubbing. groove line. That's who we'd be riding on the groove line. Rain, shine, don't mind. We're riding on the groove line tonight. Woo-hoo. You know, I'll tell you what, though. Yeah. You're right about one thing. It does pay to get a good night's sleep, to be rested, to be relaxed, and also to be calm about things. And we have a lot of things here on the on the various programs that we do to help you in your efforts to relax and sleep and ignore the outside world and all of the horrible influences in it. And our friends at CB Distillery are one of them because everybody needs better sleep. Everybody needs to be calmer. Everybody needs to be more stress-free, less anxiety. And I'll have you know that our friends at CBDistillery.com, by the way, have, have got that stuff nailed down because Well, for example, Dr. Kevin Fry, our friend Kev, we're on a first-name basis now because he's a Mayo Clinic-trained internist. He worked directly under Dr. Ken Ramey at the Mayo Clinic, and he interned— not not that kind of intern. Well, he's, he's, he's been around people who know what they're doing, and he learned by watching. They didn't actually teach him anything. He just observed. It's osmosis, this old medical thing. And, and now he's a specialist, I'll have you know, and he recommends the fine range of products from CB Distillery because they're all natural. They're packed. I mean, chock full. I mean, jammed tighter than a tick. I mean, tighter than the skin on a hot dog. Packed with whole body healing plant compounds and vital nutrients in the full range of carefully formulated CBD and other plant-based solutions that are proffered by CB Distillery. Did you know, Brian, CBD, now a lot of people just say that, CBD, I just did, see there, I'll say it again, CBD, but a lot of people don't know what that stands for. Now, in the plant world, there are the cannibals and they're the tetrahydra cannibals. Apparently, these cannibals eat each other. Where are you getting this? Because, well, I, I looked it up. It's science. Because now they take the THC, that's the tetrahydra cannibals. They take that out of this stuff, or elsewise you might flunk some tests you need to take at some point. But the regular cannibals, hence the CBD, they, that stays in there. There are no cannibals involved in any of this. Well, it's CB Distillery is people. 
And that's what they do, a little tit for tat. They've been eating people for so long, so no, CD no, no. Distillery has figured out. No, 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 no it's cannabis. If you, grind, if you grind these son of a bitches no. up, no. and, you, and you put them in the grinder, when you turn it out and you put a little food coloring on these bastards, they don't taste too bad, and they'll help you relax. Cannibals. Yeah, see, someone saw another brick in the wall in theaters, and this is what happens. No, yeah. we're talking about cannabis, not cannibals. Oh, oh, wait, cannabis, not cannibals? What did you say? The techno cannibals are coming at you. <laughs> cannibals, not. C I'm cannabis. sitting here trying to figure out what you're talking about, and you just keep going. Well, I was doing the research, and I thought it was tetrahydrocannabal, but you're saying it's cannabis, not cannibal. Cannabis. cannabis. Well, never mind. But folks, I'll tell you what. If you want. Better sleep, 90%. We've quoted this statistic of customers report better sleep with CBD. 81% say CBD helps with stress and anxiety. Just under that at 80% report less physical or less pain or physical pain. Or bless pain, whatever you or said. Whatever. <laughs> I'll start again if you want me to. 80% report less pain after physical activity, whether it's Physical or mental pain, I don't know. They enjoy better focus and concentration. And 0.4% reported making love to Galactus after taking no. the fine products from CB Distillery. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a statistic not in our copy, for the record. It's, it's still being researched because it's such a fine no, number. Not. By who? Well, by the fucking international fucking fecal filiacs over in Zurich. Let me get you on the right path, folks, with our 20% discount here at cbdistillery.com. All you got to do is go to that fine website, cbdistillery.com, and enter my code, JCE, for your discount. No prescription required. Nothing you have to forge. No documentation you have to falsify. They don't need shit. cbdistillery.com. Promo code JCE for 20% off anything they got in, the, in their whole stash. Their stash of CBD, of course, from CB Distillery. Yes, and, and Dr. Kevin Fry. He's the guy, he's going to have a beard and a droopy mustache. He'll be on a bicycle. When you see him coming around the corner, <laughs> have the money in your hand. He's, he's going to slow down, but he won't stop. And he'll deliver and make, you make the handoff and boom, you're done. There are no guarantees of beards and he will not be on his bicycle. He'll be in his office working on fine CBD related issues that need to be dealt with. And you can help him deal with them by purchasing some CB the story. What's the promo code one more time? JCE. How can you forget something like that? How could you forget something like that? Well, Jim... I didn't watch Raw this week because I knew I would just forget about it anyway. <laughs> Did you watch any of it? And if so, could we do this quick? Yes, we yes we can because here's the, this was I'll tell you, boy, it was not pee picking good. There was nothing. There was a lot of things going on, but nothing you really wanted to see, and it took forever to get to the point. If you did, you want to see Cody. He was first out. He goes the ring. He's over. And they showed the VTR last week. They're telling a great story here that Cody helped Jey Uso out when Drew McIntyre wouldn't because Drew's starting to turn heel, walk off on people. Because What about me? What about Drew? That type of thing. This is all interconnecting. And they were in Ontario, California, and they were sold out. I thought things were void in Ontario. For one of our sponsors, not for uh, for wrestling. What, what was he? What were you even talking about? What are you listening to? Are you I, I'm listening. You said Bueller. I didn't expect they, you to go to I the DraftKings copy. I said they were in Ontario, California, and they were sold out. Oh, that's right. But their things were void in Ontario. Void in Ontario. Wondering. Well, it doesn't specify which Ontario it could be any Ontario. And see, Ontario, California, CA, and Ontario, Canada, CA, you never know about these things. But nevertheless, they're telling a good story with the whole thing. Cody brought Jay to SmackDown, or to SmackDown, to Raw, and Jay's trying to make amends to all the people he's wronged, but nobody trusts him. This is kind of sort of like when Ole turned and, and became a babyface, and still Dusty wouldn't trust him. Whatever the case, 
And so Cody came out and cut the promo that people don't like him. They think that maybe I should have let him sink, but I helped him because he turned down the judgment day. And that shows me what kind of guy he is. And then here comes the judgment day music, but no Rhea, just Priest and Dom and Finn. And they are really, now they're just not even pretending to turn Dominic's microphone on when he's trying to talk. It's like, as you're hearing the ambient, uh, maybe, of him on the PA in the building and they're cranking the crowd way up because the crowd loves to boo over him. So, but it's going to get annoying when they actually have to fucking impart some kind of information. But then the heels menace Cody and Jay shows up. But they're still outnumbered, so the heels continue to menace because J.D. Funko brings them chairs. But Priest says, wait a minute, we shouldn't do this. Oh, that's when Owens and Zane showed up. And then Priest says, don't do this, but the rest of the heels rolled in and got the shit kicked out of them. So then Priest, oh, well, what the fuck? He has to roll in, and he gets the shit kicked out of him by all four of them. And that took 15 minutes just to get that done. And <sighs> we saw Otis versus Bronson Reed. We saw Tommaso Ciampa against Kaiser Wilhelm. I'm sure the match was wonderful, I'm sure, but you'll never guess. Kaiser Wilhelm got beat again. Tegan Knox wrestled Natalia. We were almost an hour into the show at this point. Then Seth came out for an in-ring interview, which consisted, actually, he did an entrance. Then they went to the break. Then they came back to the ring, and the fans sang for quite a while. And then he cut the promo to allow them to sing some more. And then Shaky Nakamura showed up on the screen because that is going to continue with the last man standing match, the same rules as AEW's Texas Death Match. And Nakamura did his promo in Japanese with the subtitles and the weird constipation faces. And then he was done. And then Seth reacted to it. It took forever. Because he was being dramatic. And then they finished with more singing. And it was 15 minutes from the time his entrance started until the end of his interview after Shaky's interview interrupting his interview. It's like you're in the goddamn Twilight Zone where nothing will fucking happen. Yeah, sounds like a great episode. Do, where did we see Dragon Lee? Dragon Lee, he's he, he's good. I've seen him do some. <laughs> no, I've seen him have some good matches, and he's good. However, the last time we saw him was teaming up. Was it with Roosh and someone else? And they he, unmasked him right when they the, went off the air. Okay, he was the guy they pulled his mask off for no reason, and then he went to the WWF the next week. And then he signed with WWE. AEW had been trying to sign him, apparently, and he decided to go to WWE, and now here he is, Dragon Lee. Well, he's dragon ass. Um, the, the NXT North American title, and this is what they're doing smart. Dominic is the North American champion on NXT while he's on Raw and in the middle of the Judgment Day. And they've had Becky Lynch has gone to NXT. They've had more crossover of the mainstream uh, main roster talent going in that direction and some more attention. And NXT is now over 800,000 viewers on most weeks here lately and got up to what a quarter of about a million or so here not long ago. So now, as I think we mentioned this on uh, last week's show, they've started doing what. I don't know why they just started doing earlier, and that's really integrating, you know, people who need to be crossed over in this thing. However, Dominic defended his North American title against Dragon Lee, who was announced at 165 pounds. He's a stocky little fella, but the girl ring announcer is taller than he is, even in barefoot without her heels on. 
And I want to see how Dominic's work is progressing, but this was not the showcase for that because the gymnastics started after Dominic threw two nice punches. So he won. I don't want to, I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm going to wait till he has a wrestling match with somebody that can work to tell me if he can work or not, because the cheerleading routines he's well-versed in. So you're not even going to give Dragon Lee a chance. Oh, good God. He's interchangeable with every other. There's a reason why Mil Moscaris made a fucking fortune in the United States, not only because he was doing the he had looked like a movie star, which he was, and had the great body and was doing the flying crossbody off the top rope. But it's because there weren't 18 other people on television wearing the same kind of mask with the same kind of body and the same kind of build doing the same kind of shit. You know, you brought up NXT. Did you see that they had, um, I, I thought you may have seen this because I saw it on Twitter. They did a vignette video for Brian Pillman Jr. I saw it on Twitter because it... it I uh, obviously um, we haven't watched NXT in a while. And I actually looked at last week's recap to see if I was missing anything. And I can't pronounce the names of the talent on the roster. And I can't imagine why anybody named them that. And it just, it turns me off from what the fuck. Uh, but we might have to, if old Brian Jr. is around, we might have to check that out. But it was a brief tease from what I understand. Hey, let's see if they keep pumping this show up until they sell the rights to it. Did you, by the way, did you see the Nia Jax live interview with Michael Cole? Nia Jax, and no, I certainly, of all the things I didn't watch on this show, I didn't watch this the most. They actually had her come to the ring and do a live interview with Michael Cole, who I assume they put him in there because hey, when's the last time you ever saw Nia Jax do a fucking live interview? I ever. Don't, I don't remember. Right. I well, mean, I don't. Know. There's good reason for that. Her story is she's the most dangerous woman or dangerous human or dangerous person or whatever in the WWE, and she listed all the people that she had crushed and squashed for a shoot, apparently. And it was reciting a memorized, you know, dissertation with, it was like Sable's talent and voice was transplanted into a refrigerator wrapped in pleather. The same Jesus monotone, Christ. the same, the same kind of a husky voice, but mono, monotonic with no inflection and no oomph except for a manufactured oomph at, and then Zoe Stark came out and got up in her face and dared her to do something about it. So she did. They had a pull apart with two referees pulling them apart and neither one of them took a bump. They just, the referees were in between and it was a male and female referee. Couldn't two of them were holding Nia Jax and Zoe Stark back from each other. It's interesting. Remember, Nia Jax had issues publicly. She aired them out, I believe, with Ronda Rousey, right? I think so. Who called herself the world, what would they call it? The world's most dangerous woman or the most dangerous woman in the world? I don't remember exactly what her nickname was because, you know, she was just there a few months ago. <laughs> I have no <laughs> memory what her nickname was. But it's interesting now they're kind of taking that and giving it to Nia Jax, who actually had a, apparently, had a problem with her. Well, thing is, Ronda Rousey wasn't really dangerous. She was like that. She was the baddest woman on the planet. That's what it was. That's what it was. She was but, bad. But Nia Jax is really the most dangerous person in the WWE to the talent. And then they had a match, by the way, uh, Nia and Zoe. But how was Nia, it? Well, I zipped ahead to the finish just to see if Zoe walked out under her own power. The bonsai was a working bonsai drop. Feet flat on the mat, held the top rope, and then once that the bounce had happened, then put weight on her. So somebody must have spoken to her in some fashion. What Next time she wrestles, watch her match, just because you talk so much about her. Let's actually evaluate her in-ring work. Maybe she's really worked hard. I I think I saw enough to possibly shoot that scenario down but 
Any coincidence to the fact that Rock shows up right around the same time that she shows up again? <sighs> yeah. I don't... I don't know would he would he go that far for one particular family member or is it just that they they thought they got an idea See that's the thing would the rock help someone if there wasn't a camera there to film him doing it Well yeah, yeah. you say tomato and I say tomato Tomato Champa that's Tommaso to you. <laughs> I just can't remember whether it's two M's and one S or two S's and one M or whatever it is. We never M's. could spell his yeah, fucking name. That's right. what throws you off. I got used to it finally. It's two M's. But only one S. Are there any more S's on this show? I'd like to buy a vowel. <laughs> so anyway, they had Ms. TV. We were two hours into the show by this point. Ms. TV with Drew McIntyre and Ms. asked the question. Uh, basically, why did Drew leave Jimmy to be beaten up by the Judgment Day? And then he talked for five minutes until Drew said, Karma's a bitch. And then the New Day music played, and out came the New Day with a trombone, and I said, I'm done. They had a match, Drew and Kofi, but one of the Vikings came down and jumped on Woods and beat him up, and Kofi got distracted, and McIntyre beat him with a kick. And then the Viking got in and beat up Kofi, too, and Drew walked off and let it happen. No good son of a bitch. And then we were ready for the main event. That was two and a half hours, what I've just described, all that fucking... Okay, well, listen, there are a couple of things there that were intriguing. I would have liked to have seen Dragon Lee versus Dominic, and I would have liked to have seen Nia Jax's promo and match, just for the uh, perverse joy of whatever it could be. Yeah. Was the main event... My biggest fear, one of the biggest reasons I don't watch Raw, which is it always feels like the same people having the same match every week for the main event. Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn against Damian Priest and Finn Balor. Well, at least it wasn't a trios match. And I'm sure the match was wonderful, but I was running low on time. But basically, Dominic interfered and Priest hit Sami with a big move and got a two count. And then Uso jumped up and and grabbed Dominic and jumped on him. And here came J.D. Funko out, and he got on Jay, and then Cody saved Jay. And actually, Cody ran through the ring and dove out the other side and hit fucking old J.D. Funko and knocked him backwards over the desk, and he almost wiped out Michael Cole. I mean, it was like he was a fucking crotch hair away. And then they had a big schmoz on the floor, and J.D. hit Sammy with the title belt, and Priest pinned him. And then, actually, the last couple minutes, the faces came back out and had a big fucking brawl all around ringside, and it you almost got a flash of an old Mid-South wrestling episode if you were drunk enough, but that was probably the best part of the show. That was that. All right, that was Raw, a quick Raw review. Did you see um the other day J.D. McDonough on Twitter? No. Was he naked or what? What are you talking about? What was he doing? Uh, he wasn't naked. I didn't know that's what you look for when uh, you look for well, no, wrestlers I mean, you said, on did Twitter. You see him? He was out Pervert. there on Twitter. I thought he had his fucking tallywhacker hanging out or Why something. Why would that be the first thing you think of? Did you see him on Twitter the other day? Oh, he must be nude. Well, normally if you say, did you see what somebody wrote on Twitter or somebody said on Twitter, but not, did you see this guy on Twitter? It was like he was just hanging out there for the world to see. Well, the other day he tweeted out a picture. It says his name and it appears to be a photo of him with a Funko Pop head <laughs> put on top of it. And he wrote, who made this confess with a couple angry faces. And then someone, a listener, I presume, Ryan Cunningham, said you can definitely thank Jim Cornette for this. <laughs> you were referred to as J.D. McFunko several times. Not sure who actually made the art, but full credit to Jim. <laughs> so, let's well, no, but actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> but now, I, I don't want to steal somebody else's work because wasn't it... Who was it? Was it Cena? Or who was it that cut the promo saying your head looks like you have a Funko Pop or something? Was it Cody? We were, we were, maybe it was, Co it was Cody. It was Cody. We were remarking on that. So I don't want to steal somebody else's work. Well, JD McDonough replied, 
Corny can call me whatever he wants. He's entertained me for years. Ah, Isn't that, bless his little heart. Well, I've, at least he's got a good, a good head on his shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> you see, you see, you see this guy, I now support him. He's one of us. And you go out there and immediately go right back to the gutter. No, and I'm, I'm, I'd like to give him advice. Do neck bridges. That way, you get older, the weight of your head could cause a sudden droop. All right. Well, we've had multiple conversations about droop <laughs> today on the show. That's <laughs> drooping. A first. Head, heads drooping. Heads will droop. How do you feel when you hear that a wrestler? I mean, we've seen, and there's a lot that people don't know publicly. Just wrestlers get upset because they're fans of yours, and then you reject them publicly in a very vocal manner and then all of a sudden they hate you but they still love you they're still fans of you well here's the thing if if they're fans of mine or fans of yours and mine ours yours mine and ours yours let's give you all um, the credit all right whatever the k or the blame is however it may be and they still go out there and do stupid shit uh, then why are they fans of mine if 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 they like it when I tell other people they're doing stupid shit and they do the same shit? Now, if they're not doing the same shit, then we probably won't call them goofs unless... I mean, it's, it's, it's not JD's fault about his preternaturally large head. Will you stop? First of all, There's, you're not even criticizing his work. You're just talking about his physical traits. No, I'm just traits. talking about the goddamn... the state of his noggin, his large bucket... Fucking cranium. Will you stop? It Jesus Christ. It's, it's, there's nothing he can do about that. So I'm not faulting him for it. I'm just mentioning it. It's not like I hate that son of a bitch because he's got that fucking head. It just, it has to be referenced. It's like the 800 pound head in the room. But at the same point, what I'm saying is he looks in other ways like he's fucking seven years old. And, and, and I'm, you know, the little weasel that wants to be in the judgment day is starting to grow on me because at least Priest recognizes that he doesn't fit with the cool kids. But it's like, you know, he's he's kind of a conniving... He's a cross between Eddie Haskell and Lumpy Rutherford. No, he's not. Will you he's, a, he's, a, he's a conniver. <laughs> he's the conniver that's trying to get in. You can see it in his eyes, but at the same point... Old Lumpy never got invited to hang out with the fucking school jocks. You know who would have been a good Eddie Haskell? Jacques Rougeau. Oh my God, yes. When he was young, he probably was. But thank you, JD, for letting us entertain you for low these many years. Well, that's very nice. And again, I think a lot of the listeners saw this and now uh, makes you look at him in a different light. And obviously, he didn't take anything personal. And as a matter of fact, if sometimes, if you're looking at him in the dark, that would probably even be better because then you wouldn't, his head blocks out the light, the whole sun coming at you. All right, well, for his sake, we'll move on to another topic to get you talking about someone else's uh, body parts or whatever it may be. <laughs> uh, Jim, there's a lot of things happening in the world of wrestling. And you can't lay your hands on any one particular one, right? But well, can you now? I can. I have some audio here I pulled up, but we'll discuss it first. Yesterday, and actually, let me pull up the email that I got from WWE. Oh, hey, did they? are they bothering us again? They made a big deal out of this everywhere, so let's talk about it. I got an email yesterday, 1031 a.m. WWE signs Jade Cargill to multi-year deal. Stanford, Connecticut, September 26, 2023. WWE, part of TKO Group Holdings. Today announced it has signed Jade Cargill to a multi-year contract. Cargill, a standout performer who has earned accolades as an industry-renowned talent, will begin training today at the WWE Performance Center in Orlando. An industry-renowned talent. Who we need to retrain. She has, she's... She'll be getting training today. That's how it ends. <laughs> she's wrestled. <laughs> yeah, that... She's wrestled in one company in the industry, so industry -wide renowned, and now we're going to teach her how to wrestle. And, but you know what? Here's the thing. It's not, this is what you should do. They're making a big deal out of signing somebody right out of the gate. I'm sure they think that because of her 
limited amount of experience, but at least she's not starting from scratch, that they will be able to get her to where she can, you know, be featured in NXT fairly quickly and then move to the main roster and they oh, can I think document go- that journey. I think, what? She's, I think she's going right to the main roster. I don't think she's going to NXT. Well, if, okay, so then if you, technically you don't have to appear in NXT if you're training at the Performance Center. They can just keep you under wraps and then debut you on the main roster. I mean, they only tape NXT for a couple hours yeah. a week. Um, but point being, they're making a big deal out of signing, and it's not just because she came from AEW, because again, a lot of her audience, or a lot of her, bleh, let me try that again, a lot of their audience doesn't know about AEW to begin with, the male or female talent, but she looks like something. And so it works, and they've obviously, again, got some kind of idea that somebody high up is enamored of the writers have sold or somebody in management says that this gimmick or this idea or this character, as they say, we got to have this girl, we're going to do this boom, boom, boom. And they're starting. And, but I'll tell you what, at first four years ago, it was everybody looking to get out of their WWE contract so that they could go over to the sunny side of the street where the grass is always greener, directly over the septic tank. And WWE was having to up their bids to try to keep these people. And now that a bunch of people have been over there and seen what's going on, the return trip is, even though it's more limited, Tony took everybody he could get. They've got Cody. They got Jane. They're probably going to get MJ, her too. They're probably going to get MJF and punk. it and the, and Punk. That's pretty much a foregone conclusion. Well, I wouldn't say that, but like, well, if if he wants to continue to wrestle, then we, as we've established, there's nobody else available to the WWE at at that level right now. So that's. <laughs> Within a year and a half, or well, Cody's been a, two years. Within a, that period of time, they've cherry picked, or will have cherry picked, three or four people from the other company and made them bigger than they ever were in that company and bigger than they've ever been. Because they're just picking the right fucking people now, rather than let's sign all these motherfuckers away from him. Yeah, you know, as clunky as everything was in the early days of Jade on AEW TV, she always exuded confidence and an aura. You know, she has a star-like presence. Yeah. I don't know what else you would say. She seems to be someone who can carry that. That's what WWE wants, people who can be that star everywhere and represent them. She, from everything I heard, is, I don't know how you want to say it, trainable. She's an athlete. Coachable. Yeah, she coachable's better to better way to say it. She works well with coaches. She's looking to improve. She's not one of these people, look at me, I got a six pack, I'll be a wrestler. So this will be really interesting to see now that she's in their program, how they train her, retrain her, reteach her, and then what she's based on the press release that went out and the way they're making a big deal out of this. Would you be shocked if they brought her up and didn't use her as a star? Oh, but, but uh, no. Yes, I would be shocked. They are definitely going to bring her to wherever she goes and use her as a star. They wouldn't be starting this like this. And, and there's going to be some element of training and retraining. But as you mentioned, if she's coachable, that's going to be a, a point in her factor, but a uh, factor in her direction or whatever the fuck I'm saying. Blah, blah, blah. But remember with what we've seen of her on television, she did a media interview not long ago where she said that, well, the first time she hit somebody with a chair, they just said, yeah, I hit her with a chair. And I think it was, it was, did she say it was punk? It was that punk. Came in yeah. And said, look, choke up on the legs here and do like this. Because they were just going to let this girl go out and whack somebody with a fucking chair, with uh, not say boo to a goose about how to do it. And that's part of the problem, is that they're going to have to make sure that 
in the WWE at the Performance Center that they, you've got, you wouldn't know that somebody that's been in wrestling uh, featured at that level on national TV might not know how to do this thing or that thing until you ask and until it comes up. So they're probably going to have to get a feel for her and try to figure out what she's good at and what areas she has not been instructed in as well. You know, there's so many problems with women's wrestling right now, but from afar, if you look at like the top women in AEW, and you look into the WWE that in a year or so could have a Rhea Ripley, a Bianca Belair, a Jay Cargill, in terms of just look, you know, one group has women that look like they can kick your ass, <laughs> and they could also work, hopefully. I mean, well, at least Bianca and Rhea. So Where far. is Bianca? Where has she been lately? I think she's uh, taking time off. Oh, well, just, that's good for her. She can just take time off. Just go away and be off. But you wouldn't have said no. If Jim <laughs> Crockett said, Jim, I'll give you all the money. Just stay home for a while and hang out and uh, you can come back. Would you have said, no, I must be there? Actually, in those days, yes, I would have. To save your spot? But, uh, huh? To save your spot? Well, I'll, yes, to, but also out of sight, out of mind. You know, if if you're if you're gone, you're gone. No, I mean, how can I miss you if you won't go away? Though we hadn't got to that part yet. But no, I'm I'm just kidding. Poor Bianca. It, well, it's it, she can take time off if she wants to. We'll be waiting when she gets back. I have some audio I want to play you in a moment of Jade talking on ESPN about all this. But one last thing, uh, and I kind of brought this up the other day. When you look at how things are now, and the big deal WWE's making out of signing someone, they're not even naming obviously where she used to work. So if you don't know, you don't know. How big of a mistake is it for Tony to take someone, immediately build her up on TV, and at the end of the day, what did he get out of it? Like She lost at the pay-per-view, then she lost the second match on Rampage, and then she was never seen ever again on that show. Is that, a, is that the correct way to get... I hate to say, like, get something out of... You know what I mean. Get something out of the push you're giving someone. Well, that's but that's exactly what it is. It's a transactional piece of business. If you take an individual and train them and feature them on your television and push them and give them wins over all of these other members of the talent roster, they're, Jane got something out of it. She got put over as a star and a personality and et cetera. And in return, what the promoter is supposed to get out of it is that this will lead to increased attendance or bigger buy rates or merchandise or just people watching television. Yeah, uh, we've mentioned that she did get good, good TV numbers. It's not like it was suddenly CM Punk time every time she was on, but, you know, it didn't. Her numbers didn't stink the joint out most of the time like the buckaroos or whatever. But there was no, there were no tickets sold based on her because she wasn't, she was on the show, but you wouldn't buy a ticket. The uh, first thing you say, oh, I'm going to see Jane Cargill live. And there was no pay-per-view boost because she was never featured in any kind of meaningful pay-per-view match that you would have it was, there was no Charlotte versus Ripley level, you know, Becky Lynch versus whatever in a cage on WrestleMania. There it was just, it was her weekly showcase match to win in seven or eight minutes. And I don't know about her merchandise. Was she on any lists? Was, were they, were the baddies hoodies flying off the fucking shelves? Well, if it's like the other AEW merchandise, whatever was sold was sold online. They probably didn't have it at the arenas. So point being, she got plenty out of it. And it's not really her fault because she wasn't telling them to use her that way. It's not her fault that they didn't get anything out of it. They got one meaningful job to Statlander. And... That's, you know, but, but uh, that's it. So there you go. And now, and she's made the statement that she knew she had to go to the big boys, the big company to get the best training and have the most opportunities to be the biggest star. She said that in 
So many words. What's what's she saying in your audio? Well, Jim, let's go to this audio. This is from ESPN. Jade Cargill speaking with uh, whoever this reporter is, filming his face right in front of the camera. Very well lit, a giant face. Let's hear what the face and Jade Cargill have to say. For ESPN, joined today by WWE's newest free agent signing, Jade Cargill. Massive get from AEW for WWE. It's your first day. How's it going? How's how's everything down in uh, the Performance Center in Orlando? It's going great, Mark. How are you doing? And thank you for breaking the news. I appreciate that. You did an amazing job doing that. But it's been great. Um, Stop right there. He did an amazing job breaking the news. Eh. Well, and and to be quite honest, he sounds... Is he doing this from high school radio, or is this guy a legitimate on-air reporter? No, I believe he's one of their uh, legitimate on-air uh, or off-air or audio he might be, He might be a good off-air reporter. I don't think he's a good on-air personality, but I will digress well, later. Let's see what happens, but uh, Jay Carr, I will say when he said a good steal from AEW, she was nodding her head yes, but let's go to this. <laughs> How's uh how's the first day at the at the new school? What have you what uh what are you what are you up to? What have you been doing? You've been asking you're asking too many questions now. You don't need to know that. <laughs> Just know I'm working hard and doing the work to uh create some dream matches. Okay, okay. I do want to ask you about dream matches, but I, I figure you know you're the you're the new girl at school, so there might be some interesting uh, like, interactions <laughs> going on over there in uh in uh the performance center. Um I, a lot of people want to know like uh do you know if you're going to start in NXT? Or are you going to be main roster? Has oh, here we go. Really That's what we were yet? wondering. It has. And guess what? Everybody's going to have to tune in to every network and see mm-hmm. where I'm going. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to stir the pot and to get people guessing where I'm going to be. So just tune in. Okay, I guess that was that was the answer that, that WWE <laughs> wanted. Uh, <laughs> to get, uh, on the television shows, I get it. I get it. A lot of people want to know, Jade. I guess uh, you were in AEW from the start of your career, 2021. Only two years, by the way. Still, still very young in this game. Why, why the move? Why, why WWE, and why now? The leadership. I mean, Paul, Bruce, Dan, and Nick. I mean, you can't get any better than that. And I'm the first signing under the TKO umbrella. I mean, there's so many different things. Where else can you go to get the best quality training? Nowhere else. The PC here is is one of one. There's nothing else like it. Um, the the machine is behind you. The platform, um, just the overall history, the legacy. I'm um, creating a household name. I mean, I can go on and on. I mean, why ah. not? The question more so is why not? Let me stop it there for a second. I'm creating a household name. See, here's the thing. She is completely convinced that her farts smell like fucking pretty flowers you can tell because she because she carries herself like a star she's convinced she is one when she was doing whatever the fuck it was we decided that one week or we established that she was doing that she thought she had a bunch of fans before she was on AEW television she thought she was a star and you've got to have some element of that of course reality has to be involved somewhere in terms of humility and don't believe your own publicity and blah, blah, blah. But she was convinced that once she got her foot in the door, she needs to go to the biggest company and go to the best school and work with the top fucking women. And you can tell it because she thinks she's going to be one of them. Well, that right there to me is the big question I had for you. What does that say about, I mean, again, she's not really saying about what her experience exactly was in AEW, but she gets there. Cody and Brandy had a big part of things. Eventually, Brandy was kind of cut out of things. Eventually, Cody was gone. If you're new in the business and you're just kind of, I'm not saying she necessarily was flailing backstage because there's no direct communication from someone who knows what the hell they're doing. Yeah, or knows or knows what the hell the top is doing. Like None of these things would happen in WWE. So when you have someone who's coming from being an athlete, someone who had training, coaching for years and excelled at it to the point where she was competing in sports into college. If you're going to try to have a career, there's AEW, which is just like, again, without the hard drugs, it's like more of an ECW vibe (laughs) backstage versus WWE who can make you into a household name. Yeah, there's there's more of an element of, you know, oh, the wrestlers have the creative freedom. 
and we can, you know, be more of ourselves, which as we found out, we always were screaming for, but unfortunately, especially with this generation, that's not always a good thing. It's always been sketchy when a wrestler had too much pull through the territories and everything else, but it's outlandish these days. But for somebody who's brand new and didn't grow up immersed in this as a fan from the smart fan perspective, she's got to be going, what the fuck? Everybody's just going out and doing shit. What the fuck is the rhyme or reason here? You need, that's why, again, it was always veterans that were allowed to have leeway with their shit because you don't want people that have, are brand new on the jobs. I'll go out and do whatever you want. Good Lord. That's the way you see what you get. So for somebody like that who may have wanted to have a little more insight on why is, why is all this shit going on, she probably was just kind of spinning around, and, they, and then she'd go out and have a match and do moves. And she poses great. And nobody maybe has sat down and explain to her, well, you know, here's the way you think about a match this way or that way or the, the amount of, of offense you give versus the finish versus how you're being presented versus how your opponent's being presented versus here's how you, uh, little tips on how to get some more heat with people or get them to listen to you on your pro, whatever. That's why if if you're a veteran, you've always had some kind of leeway if you drew money. But most of the time, the average rank and file wrestlers on the card followed the instructions and the style that the booker and that promoter of that territory liked. Because then everybody was on the same page, not just out there fucking chaos. There was no, no such thing as a hardcore match on third and a lucha match on fifth, because it makes no fucking sense. Well, let's hear a little more from Jade and the uh, ESPN reporter. I like how we you're on He may be. Mike Wallace is not in trouble here. Mike Wallace is dead. Well, he's still not in trouble here from this guy. Those guys. Just <laughs> Nick and, you know, all the, all the big wigs. Yes, of course, of course. It, it feels to me, just from the outside looking in, that they've rolled out the red carpet for you. They've given you kind of the star treatment on day one right away. Does it feel that way for you? Yes, I would say that. I would say that. Um, I think that they see that it's in me. I think they know that I work hard and that I'll bring that hard work over here to the PC and I'll do what it takes to be a household name and to create that legacy. Hey, let me stop uh, right there. I have a question for you because you've you know, you've trained or been a part of the training of so many different people or observed people you didn't train. When you're dealing with a, an athlete coming out of competing all four years in college, let's say, can anyone train them or do you need a specific type of trainer to be able to work with them? Because like was Brock and, was Brock and Shelton, oh, that's bad English. Were Brock and Shelton's training similar or did you have to customize it a little bit based on how an athlete's used to training? Is, is my question well, making any sense at all? Yes. Well, because it, there wasn't even anything customized specifically for Brock and Chef for college athletes versus other type of athletes other than or other type of trainees other than those guys were generally already in better cardio shape unless there had been some layoff of, of a long period of time when they were competing. Um. But then again, some of the guys that grew up as pro wrestling fans that worked indies that came into the program or even just had a, a better clue of, of how the business worked versus the complete shooters, they were more relaxed in the ring. <laughs> so therefore, sometimes their cardio would be better than these goddamn you know, workout gym rat, machine beast type of, that were so fucking high strung in the ring because they were green and they didn't know what they were doing, that they didn't breathe. But you train uh, wrestlers the same way, whether they've been 
amateur athletes or not in terms of just the general concepts of the business. And then you might want to work individually with guys if they were shooters to be able to project that in a working way or if they were something else to be a football player to be able to project that in a working way. And I, th I think a lot of it also is the individual student. It's not that Brock was not used to being coached all of his life. It's that he wasn't as natural a pro wrestler in any way, shape, or form as Shelton Benjamin was. He both wasn't as flashy a personality. He was a he'd sit there, bump on a log on the on the bench. And he wasn't as much of a fan of the business as Shelton had been growing up in South Carolina, watching it as a kid. So not only didn't he know how to do this shit and how to come up with his snazzy shit that he wanted to do. But he wasn't real motivated because it wasn't fun to him. It was a fucking job. Now, maybe 20 years later, it's become fun to him because he can bop in and out as he pleases. So it took Brock a little bit more to come out of his shell personality-wise and to not only understand the moves, which he was strong enough and athletic enough to do, but how to do them with personality. Don't just pick a guy up and plan him. Pick a guy up and make a mean face and make it look like you fucking squashed him type of thing. Shelton was farther ahead than almost anybody, much less Brock at that point in time with just being a good in-ring wrestler. And then he learned psychology. All right, Jim, let's hear a little more audio from Jade. You, you, uh, like I said, you've only been wrestling for a little over two years and, you know, your first match was a tag team with Shaquille O'Neal, you know, so you you were already kind of, you debuted in a high-profile fashion. You continue to be a high-profile star at AAW, the longest-reigning TBS champion over there. And and it was a little bit of a surprise for some people that that you were leaving because that was kind of where you started. What what happened with AAW? Can, can you just take it through that, through that process of why you left? Nothing happened with AEW. You know, they're still them. They're still a phenomenal company. Um... It's just I wanted to create something that nobody else can do. And, and where else can you create that leadership role? Where where else could you be a household name? Where else can you create that legacy? I want to be in the Hall of Fame. There is no other place. I wanted to be at the PC working my butt off and working with the best trainers that wrestling has to offer. You know, I worked with the Daniel Bryans, like phenomenal guy, phenomenal, you know. Um, but he came here, right? So... I thought that this is a no-brainer. I thought that I could, couldn't get any better as far as in the ring than to come here and to join a mega company. Did you get the bag? Let me stop it there. What do you think of that answer? Well, and she's telling the truth. and Yeah, she's not wrong. <sighs> and she's not wrong, but here is what, if, if, if she was my talent that I just signed, and she's doing these media interviews. I know she's being legitimate. She's being real. She's telling the truth. But the way that I would want, and the way that I have a premonition they're going to use her is some type of really elite level athlete, some type of gimmick that just realized she is just a, a physical piece of perfection or whatever. A female Alexander Carroll in the experiment, right? The Russian. Whatever the case, I would have her even now. Not putting the company down, but grouping herself with the company in terms of instead of saying, I'm going to work my butt off and I want them to, the best trainers to teach me, coming at it from the direction of, I'm the best. I'm the best female athlete on the planet in any sport. And that's why I wanted to go to the biggest pro wrestling company on the planet or biggest, whatever they call it. I want the best performance center, the best trainers, because I'm the best athlete that they've ever worked with. They'll need a team of specialists to keep up with me, to make sure that my incredible genetics are finely tuned at all times. I'm going to have an entire team at my disposal. And I, uh, yes, AEW is a great company and I learned a lot there and thank you, but I'm moving on now to stadiums and fucking WrestleManias and pay-per-views and leaving a legacy and a hall of fame because I'm that good. Be an obnoxious, arrogant bitch because probably your gimmick 
will probably, you know, reflect something like that. With the way that she looks, it's so striking. Be aloof. Be the total package. Be Lex Luger, but with be able to have meaning to it and kind of connect with the people better than Lex, poor Lex, did at some points. You see what I'm saying? Instead of just saying, oh, I hope they'll teach me and I want to learn, I'm going to work. She shouldn't have to say, I'm going to work my butt off because she should already be saying, everybody else is going to have to work their butt off and step their game up just to be able to compete with me and not get embarrassed. Well, the problem is you're not wrong, obviously, and you're the promoter and a booker, so you know what you want the star to do. But in this WWE system, would she piss off other talent or even Paul, Bruce, Nick, well, no, and Dan? They should, or whatever. they should be telling her to say that is what I'm saying. Not the talent, Paul and Bruce and... Tom and Carol and Ted and Alice or whoever the fuck she mentioned, whatever, the, the talent can get mad or get glad if somebody's cutting a promo in public saying, I'm the best, I'm better than all these other fucking people in the wrestling business, and you get mad at them for that, you need to find another line of fucking work. If they're specifically saying, well, I'm better than fucking old Josephus over there, I'll tell you that, because he's the shits. Well, now you might have a fucking gripe. But if this, you know, highly recruited, just signed future superstar is saying, that's right, I am better than every other woman athlete on the planet, that's part of the fucking gimmick, and she looks like it might be true. It's not like that poor old Sky Blue is coming out and saying, I'm the most elite level athlete on the planet. That probably wouldn't fly. And again, this is Jade talking to ESPN. Let's go back to this. You can, just between us, did you get the bag, Jade? You can I tell him. You can tell me. I am the bag. I am the bag. <laughs> what? Fair did enough. he just call her a bag? He said, did you get the bag? And she said, I am the bag. Well, you old bag? What? What is, is, is that some slang the, the kids use these days? That, well, in WWE, it's a change. You know, it's family friendly, so she can't be that bitch show anymore. Now she's that bag show. <laughs> Let's go back to Jade and ESPN. Uh, your, uh, one of your mentors, Cody Rhodes from the Nightmare Factory, I know that you trained with him a little bit and you know you went to his school down in Georgia. He signed with WWE last year from AEW. How much of a factor uh, you know, of Cody already being there helped you? Good question. Top three reasons and uh, was top two. Uh, Cody is a phenomenal wrestler. He's a phenomenal father. Um, he's very honest, even when he has to get brutal with it. Um, I respect Cody. I respect um, him trusting the system. And when I first came in, he was one of the few people that sat me down and was honest with me about this entire industry. And I appreciated that. Um, so one thing I'm not gonna do is let him down. I'm gonna come in here and do the work. And, and show him why uh, I'm a great pick. I'm sure he's... Good answer there. Yeah. She's very good with doing these. As I said, she probably, and, and probably will grow into it, needs more of her, I hate to say the word character again, but her, her, her public persona in these things rather than being so humble. She needs to be a little bit more stuck up. Can you imagine if Steve Austin, during the height of the Attitude Era, had done an interview with anybody in the media where he said, boy, I just, I really want to get in there and work as hard as I can to prove myself. It's not the... It, you it know, I, it I, hear, I hear you. And again, she's talking to ESPN, not, you know, yeah. the Wrestling Observer or something. Well, it's, it's, it, but it's, you know what? She's got a chance now in front of the most wide audience that she's ever been in front of to make first impression and mold their image of who she is and what she does. You know, what she just said about Cody was very interesting because I think that's exactly that in a very oversimplified way is a good example of the problems that Cody eventually ran into in AEW because that's yeah. who Cody was for good or for bad. He wanted to work with talent like that. She appreciates that to this day. She'll probably never forget that. AEW now, there isn't a Cody Rhodes there. Punk was a Cody Rhodes in a very different fashion. A different delivery, but the same kind of function. Here, I'm one of the main event guys, and also I've had a ton of experience, and here is some 
tidbits of wisdom you ought to know. I know it's crazy here. Let me be the one to sit down and help you. But let's go, go back to this. Excited to have you on board. Yes. So you mentioned dream matches. Yes. Give Talk me some me. names. What are, do, you, do you have like a list? Remember when Cody left as a free agent? I'm not sure if you were following. And he had like a list of all the people that he wanted to face. Do you right. have a WWE list of all of your, your dream matches? To be honest, it's everyone. You know, these women are the top women wrestlers in the world. You know, that's why I came here. Iron sharpens, sharpens iron. I would have never came here if I didn't think that I was going to be better. I'm here to get better. I'm here to create those moments that's going to have people wanting to come back, wanting to bring their friends. Um, I think everybody is a dream match because you've never seen me with these women ever before. So everybody's going to be invested. Um, I agree with you. She shouldn't be saying all of this in public, but she's very smart. Oh, yeah, she's putting the whole roster over that she's going to be working with as the best in the world. Uh, but at, at the same time, I think she ought to say, and by cracky, first thing I'm going to do is wipe out Rhea Ripley. Get that thing going. Go ahead. This goes a little longer, so I don't know how much longer we want to listen to Jade, so I'm, I'm going to call it there unless you want to hear more. Well, no, that's okay. I think we've got the gist of the, the conversation. But no, yeah, she's going to be big there because if again if she's coachable they can do wonders with her and she's already acceptable and she's got a great look and i i'm going to be excited to see what happens when she gets some instruction in how to actually think about the business rather than you know whatever she's been doing over there at romper room with just going out and having matches and perfecting all the moves well, Jim, after the busy day that Jade Cargill had yesterday, she was in everyone's news feed. I'm sure she needed a good night's sleep. You know, but Brian, you don't want to be on a news feed. You want to be on a snooze feed. You want to get a good night's sleep. We've been talking about this the whole program. Folks, if you listen to us, we're going to tell you how to get rest and relaxation, how to feel better, how to have less anxiety and problems because you're going to sleep 22 hours a day. And our friends at Helix Sleep are going to make it a pleasure to do so. Did you know, Brian, that Helix Sleep offers 20 unique mattresses, the award-winning Lux Collection, the newly released Helix Elite Collection, the big and tall mattress? Boy, you ought to see that goddamn thing. It's about 12 feet tall. Even well, the, no, the it's kids' for, mattress. It's for big and tall people, not... It's not an especially Well, you don't larger... think a 12-foot tall motherfucker is big and tall? Well, there are no 12-foot people out there walking around. Well, but if there are and you're in the sound of our voice, Helix will fix you up because they got all kinds of mattresses. And if you go to helixsleep.com and take their quiz, then you will find the perfect mattress in under two minutes. That's, boom, how long it takes, unless you're a slow thinker. If you're a little bit slow, it might take three minutes. But once you pick that mattress... It's shipped straight to your door free of charge because, folks, again, you don't want to be going out and laying on these mattresses that every jack leg in town has rolled over on. You don't know whether they're drooling or leaking. There could be pus involved. You don't want to go to a mattress store. You want the brand new one in the box that comes to life right in front of you so you can check it for stains. And here's another thing. Brian, did you know? That besides the fact that these mattress models are designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences, if you prefer being felt up at night, these mattresses are for you. But also, ladies and gentlemen, the memory foam layers, the optimal pressure relief, the more responsive foam, and it all comes down to the incredible all-American team that they have. They got their own manufacturing facility for these fine quality mattresses, like sleeping on a cloud, and they've got a team of experts. I thought there was four people on the team, but Brian, you say there's more, but they also are all American-made ingredients, for heaven's sake. The fabric is specially ether-soaked with American ether, so if you lay down on this thing, no. you're going to sleep like five to seven seconds. As a matter of fact, if you lay on your face, on your stomach, it's quicker. None of this is true. And None of this is true. Snort. Take a big snort. Take a big snort, and you're out. This is from the perverse mind of Jim Cornette. None of this is true, ladies and gentlemen. None of this 
is in the copy. Are you? And none of this is anything you have to worry about when you get one of the fantastic Helix Sleep mattresses. As you said, they come to life right in front of you. You open it up. Yes. Woo! Right in front of the whole family. You get to watch the show. And, and then, then take a big whiff of it, and you'll come to right death right down no, on time. You'll sleep the... You will be alive. Stop that. <laughs> you'll, you'll sleep. Have you ever heard the people say, I slept like I was dead last night. I was dead asleep. It's a, it's a colloquialism. It's a vigorous speech. But you'll drop over and fucking saw logs as soon as your head hits the oh. Helix Sleep mattress. You'll become a lumberjack in your in your uh, nocturnal hours. And you don't want to take my word for it. Who would doubt me? But Helix Sleep has over 12,000 five-star reviews. And besides that, by supporting Helix, they also support the first responders, the military, the teachers, the students, the garbage men, the dog catchers, all the people out there making your lives a living hell. They're supporting them, folks. And don't forget about the little ones, those kids' mattresses. If I could only say what I'd like to say about those, but Brian won't let me. Designed for children 3 to 12 years old. And that's good enough. That's all you need to say. You don't need to opine or give any of your other sick thoughts about anything else. These are wonderful mattresses for kids. And of course, wonderful mattresses for the whole family. Well, what you need to do then is you need to go right now to helixsleep.com slash JCE because they're offering 20% off all the mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners right here. Well, my listeners, I don't know about yours, Brian. Go to helixsleep.com slash JCE, 20% off and two free pillows. I'm telling you, you, you order the thing, it comes in a box, you unbox it, you put it on the bed. You fall and you sleep the sleep of the angels. And it's clean, too. That's right. Once again, guaranteed clean mattresses that'll make you yes. have a good night's sleep, possibly the sleep of the angels in a heavenly sort of bouncing on the clouds before you wake up once again for another wonderful day. Another Type wonderful day yeah. with Helix Sleep. But you're saying they've discontinued the ether-soaked material that helps drift you off to sleep i think that may have been something custom made by a third party for you maybe as a present or something it was the ether bunny isn't that you well see now don't confuse are you incriminating me. yourself in a very don't david lynch me. kind of yes, way i put myself out with ether it was hard to keep the goddamn the rag on my face as i started drifting off well in a non ether way. The, while all the listeners are drifting off, uh, transition us. Well, once again, the promo code in a non ether way, everyone will drift off for a good night's sleep with Helix Sleep. What's the promo code, Jim? Oh, well, that's JCE. Well, thank you so much for that. Yeah. And once again, You're Helix welcome. Sleep, very popular here in this house. We have a few of their mattresses, and I love my all form couch in the library. Well, there's a lot of things popular in your house. I don't know. You don't know, but let's talk about things you uh, you also don't know. <laughs> uh, Jim, Tony Khan is on the oh loose boy. again. I know him. <laughs> Tony Khan recently had a media call answering questions in advance of this weekend's Wrestle Dream event in Seattle. Oh, that's right. The week before the pay-per-view, he roams the countryside and people spot him in the wild. I had Jace Nakarado, better known as Jay Sharknado, go through this audio to see if there was anything worth anything worth talking about. And Please give me the answer of no. Well, there's some stuff here that he put in bold. I think that means... Are we going to listen to the voice of Tony Khan? Well, unlike in the past where we just played it all the way through, I think I'm just going to try to pick it up at several moments to find the big moments. Boy, boy, there you Good luck. And after you finish finding the big moments in Tony Khan's speech, start looking for Amel Amelia Earhart and Judge Crater. All right, well, hold on. Let's uh, look for Miss Earhart here. Let's just go to around five and a half minutes in. If this indeed works. Thanks, guys. And <laughs> here we go. Wrestle, uh, wrestle, excuse me, the last three pay-per-views we've done, Forbidden Door, uh, followed by All In and All Out. I think this is the best run of three pay-per-views we've ever done. Then Grand Slam is one of our top events of the year. That was a huge success. Um, I'm sure pretty much, hopefully, all of you on the call received the press release from Warner Brothers Discovery. If you didn't, let us know, and we'll try to get you on the 
the chain for those going forward. But Warner Brothers Discovery sent out a great press release last night touting the success of AEW Dynamite Grand Slam, which was the biggest broadcast of the year. And really, really great thing there. And that's another big major event. And just feels like we're on a great run. So it's a great time to add events. And in this case, in the form of pay-per-views. I am very open to uh, putting AEW events on a streaming platform. I think it would be a great thing. I think we're frankly close enough to the end of our media obligations here uh, and our uh, our current deal where it would that sounds like. By the way, he's been talking about. I have no idea what the question was. He's I, a, I, yeah, I, <laughs> but here's the thing: if anybody has some spare time, like a month or two. Next time he does one of these calls, count the number of times he says great. Just the word great. That's a drinking game right there. Here's what I'd like to know, and I actually don't know the answer, obviously. How many times on previous media calls or media scrums has he said we're on a great run? Because he just said it again. We're on the best run we've ever been on. They've never been on a bad run. Well, that's the it, question. It, it never... It, it's never a bad run. It's always a good run. It never, there's never traffic. It's never too hot outside or too cold. There, it never snows. It never rains. He must be ra- running in Southern California. It's always a great run. Nothing ever happens on those runs. All right, let's go like a minute ahead and see if he says anything. Sales. And now with Wrestle Dream, I really think uh, this is a chance to add another new event to the calendar. Uh, I think. We can continue adding great events, but I've never said I would put them every single month. I think there's a potential for more events and what the cadence is, whether it's monthly or, you know, uh, eight, 10, 11 or or 12. I don't, I haven't decided the exact number yet, but I do think there's an appetite for more events. Warner brothers discovery is really excited about doing more events. And right now these are living on pay-per-view, but I do think there's great potential for all of our events, uh, to live, uh, on a in in for me right now does it feel like aew is a slave to warner brothers discovery right now well that's so help me understand this he kind of just said it but apparently they can't stream anything unless it's under the auspices of warner brothers discovery correct well that may be one of the things but the other thing i was i was actually specifically speaking about was the fact that warner brothers wants more pay-per-view events that's interesting What's their part of the pay-per-views? I don't know. Hmm. Those pay-per-views better be doing real good, uh, great even, if if he's cutting the network in on some of it. I don't... Let's put it this way. I don't know what they were doing in recent years, but uh, in the glory days, USA Network didn't get a piece of Vince's pay-per-view, and I don't believe, well, it... With Turner Broadcasting before, it was all in, it going in the same bucket, theoretically. Well, let's go back to Tony Khan. Now, I mean, the, the top choice for that, to me, would be Max. I think uh, it's an amazing platform, and we're working with Warner Brothers Discovery now. And I think there is great mutual interest in it, but uh, like with all media deals where there's mutual interest, there's a lot of work that would need to go into it to figure out uh, how that would uh pay everybody because i have no interest in doing like a tryout you know at this point we've been doing this for three and a half years i'm not going to do a a six month nine month tryout on streaming i don't think that makes any sense for any of us so uh Uh, ho ho ho. is he telling on himself did anybody say that they well yeah well we'll put you on but let's try it out for six months see if you're still in business did anybody publicly say that at all or is has that been is that a thing that is often required in a deal like this? Or is this just Tony telling on himself that that's what they told him? Again, if you're in negotiations, maybe you don't want a lot of these things being aired out in public. We only do it once we give up on the negotiations and we're ready to burn <laughs> people down. But usually, when we're in the midst of it, we shut the fuck up. Well, let's go back to uh, Tony Khan. To the point where. Uh, there's a really, really big fan base for our major events. As we've shown this year, it's bigger than ever worldwide. And uh, I think Wrestle Dream is a huge pay-per-view event, and it doesn't necessarily signify the beginning of a monthly pay-per-view calendar, but it is a new event that we've never done, and it's something very special. And I'm just really excited to be here to talk about it today because I really believe in what we're doing with Wrestle Dream this Sunday. 
uh, that it's going to be an amazing event. He's like a politician. He says nothing. Here, thank you for the question that I'm going to ignore. I really appreciate that question. I'm just so happy to be here. This is such a wonderful thing. Let me talk about and pivot over here to the other thing I wanted to talk about. And let's keep talking about that. And use a lot of words. And I'm very proud uh, that we're honoring one of the people who made AEW possible, who does not get enough credit in the world of pro wrestling, who doesn't get talked about enough, despite being one of the greatest promoters. And I think pretty much unanimously recognized as one of the all-time great wrestling minds and promoters. Uh, in Mr. Antonio Inoki, and I'm thrilled that his family wants Wait, to what participate. What the fuck? He's suddenly bringing attention to one of the most famous individuals that's ever stepped foot in a pro wrestling ring in any country on earth. But well, boy, not a lot of people are thinking enough about Inoki. We need to fucking do this pay per view to call attention to him. Well, two things. One, he said that he's honoring one of the people that made AEW possible, so there'd be no AEW without Antonio Inoki. Secondly. Okay, can we can we find the six degrees of separation there? But go ahead. But as an Antonio Inoki fan, and I actually am a real big mark for Inoki, especially like 70s into the mid 80s, late 80s. Big mark for all that stuff. I'm happy someone's there to make sure no one forgets this man that no one's been talking about ever <laughs> and brings him to prominence here <laughs> by doing an event that will really epitomize the wrestling style and mind of Antonio Inoki by having a bunch of people falling on their head and <laughs> landing on their head and throwing people on their head and standing there and chopping each other. Now with pa fights. Let's go back to Tony Khan. Bait in the event and help us honor a great legend. So uh, very excited about the event. Thanks, Steve. Actually, I'm going to go forward here a little bit. Did you hear yesterday there was a rumor going around about Tony Khan that he had bought New Japan? I saw somebody said that on Twitter, and then it was it was uh, scoffed at, and that's pretty much all I saw. Well, here is uh, Tony answering a question from Sean Ross Sapp about that. Hey, Tony, there were some very random rumors that actually emerged on, I don't even know where the hell they emerged from, that you had bought New Japan. <laughs> is there anything that you can confirm, deny, debunk, anything uh, along the lines of that? I think a lot of that started with the end of an era, start of a new era comments. Well, I, I'm, I think it's really good that we've created a lot of speculation around Wrestle Dream, but I'm a little surprised as to how uh, that speculation picked up and, and specifically uh, the transactional nature of it, because we have such a great partnership right now and we're doing such great things in New Japan Pro Wrestling. So I was, great. A, little, I was a little surprised to see that. Um, and hence I put out no statement saying it's not true <laughs> overall. Uh, you know, I've really enjoyed working with new Japan pro wrestling. Uh, it's been nearly two years. We've been partners now and we've had two great forbidden door events and we've sent a number of the top AEW stars over to Japan to wrestle at the Tokyo dome on wrestle kingdom and other big events had great matches more than any other wrestling promoter or booker or anyone ever he talks like a politician like he answers everything the way a like it's a trained way of speaking almost he's answering the way a politician would give a non-answer but also try to build up all their accomplishments during their i was about to say reign we don't have a monarchy here ladies and gentlemen during their um Session. What, what, what is what, the term? The, during their term. Excuse during me. The, during their term. During their <laughs> their uh, term of service. But hold on here a second. I'm just gonna just one thing here, real quick. Okay, here we are. Tony, instead of great, try big, large, huge, majestic, noble, vast, gigantic, grand, bulky, august, dignified, extensive, extraordinary, extended, powerful. Wide, strong, unsurpassed, eminent, commanding, famous, famed, illustrious, celebrated, noted, distinguished, conspicuous, gallant, renowned, elevated, prominent, high, glorious, influential, brave, honorable, exalted, heroic, courageous, fearless, intrepid, valiant, daring, authoritative, stately, generous, magnanimous, chivalrous, high-minded, excellent, or splendid, you doesn't got to just say great. Well, on behalf of great people, thank you for defending us. But uh, let's go here. Apparently, this is Tony defending or Tony explaining what he meant by. What did His he birth? No, what? by uh, the end of an era comments in the previous ah. question. Let's ah. go to this. His birth. 
I wanted to go back to the end of an era comment and the buying a promotion rumor. I know that was probably the most prominent one, but would you go as far as saying you are not doing that? You would deny that that is credible or maybe care to eliminate any of the other rumors or clarify like what you actually meant by those comments? I definitely have no intention of clarifying what I meant by those comments. I want people to really say for you. <laughs> but, but I, uh, I, I definitely have no intention of clarifying those comments is one of the funniest things he's ever said. <sighs> well, he doesn't clarify but, anything but, but there. Arrow will come to an end. I on don't know. Uh, at Wrestle Dream, hopefully the third quarter, because it's October first, so that era is coming to an end. Well, here's Dave Meltzer asking Tony about AEW ownership and specifically Warner Brothers Discovery. So let's hear this. It oh, good. Can we do them. subtitles on this one? I'm great, Dave. Thanks. Uh, I really, really appreciate it. Hope you're doing well too. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was just going to ask you, I mean, one of the big questions and one of the big rumors going around has to do with the ownership of the company and WBD. And is there any negotiations going on or anything to, uh, do they own a minority piece or is there any negotiations going on in that direction? Uh, well, it's something we talked about a lot. Uh, there's been a lot of conversations about, uh, about that. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it's always been something I've been open to. Uh, and, you know, between uh, Warner Brothers Discovery and myself, a lot of the financial and structural details of our partnership we've been able to uh, keep between us. But uh, there are things I've always said to be true, I, that I own 100% of the voting stock in this company uh, and that I have 100% of the decision-making power in the company. Um, and I've been open uh, to taking on additional partnerships or things of that nature, but we have a, a really great deal uh, right now uh, with Warner Brothers Discovery, and uh, and I would love to uh, have an, uh, an even longer agreement. And uh, as for um, them and, and their stake in the business, I mean, uh, that is something that would be between us, uh, but I would also be open to that, to Warner Brothers uh, in, a, in a future deal, having a piece or a bigger piece potentially, uh, but I would always want to maintain 100% voting control as I have now and uh, want to maintain, uh, you know, the super majority uh, of stock, which I have now. So I think uh, these are things that are really important to me. Uh, you know, I just don't understand wait, why wait, he's, wait, wait, well, I don't wait, understand wait, why I'm, he's I'm, saying all this out loud. I'm open to them having a piece or a bigger piece. Or a bigger and piece. And blah, blah, blah. And again, he's, he's negotiating a deal with his network, talking to Dave Meltzer in a fucking closet. So, but I can understand, here's the thing, and with this goes back to the first time I ever spoke to Tony and realized he is never going to let anyone have the decision-making power in this company but him. I mean, a lot of people make decisions, but he is talked into going along with them and thinks it's his idea or it's whatever. But nobody's going to make decisions. Nobody's going to book it. Nobody's going to play with his action figures but him. But I don't know that the network would want... They don't know shit from Apple Butter about wrestling anyway, right? So do they want decision-making power? Do they want to tell Tony what to do? Do they want voting stock? Or do they just say, if we're going to put your fucking promotion on our goddamn air and plug these pay-per-views and get your guys over and you run these live events or whatever, then we want X percentage of the revenue or the income from this or that or the other fucking thing. They want money. They don't want to fucking book the finishes. He's so, the, he's demanding what we all think Vince wants. I, when, I retain a hundred percent of the voting power. It's all my decisions, my creative, everything's yeah. mine. Just give me your money. And well, the network wants the money. They don't want to do the finishes, and Vince wants the money too. It's just that Vince is in Tony's spot. And Tony <laughs> well, here's an interesting question. Let's uh, go forward a little ahead here. We talk about WrestleNomics. Here's Brandon Thurston of WrestleNomics asking about if Tony sees Fox as a potential bidder for AEW. Hi, Tony. Thanks for the time. Hey, Brandon. My we pleasure. With, with the news that Fox is not renewing SmackDown, uh, do you see Fox as a potential bidder for AEW rights? 
I don't think it would be fair uh, to talk about possible bidders or outside speculation. Right now, we're on Warner Brothers Discovery, and you know, I find that in uh, the entertainment business, there's not a lot of loyalty at times, and there should be. And this is a family business. We're not a public company. Um, I'm not, you know, even even if I get punched in the face. Uh, with circumstances, it doesn't mean that I'm going to take it out on the staff by cutting 100 staff or laying off 30 wrestlers. Huh. And If he gets punched in the face, he won't fire the wrestlers. But I guess if he's scared for his life, he can get rid of his biggest star. Well, I think his, his in all fairness to Tony, he's, he's just uncomfortable with a lot of English words. And he's, <laughs> if I get punched in the face by circumstances, which is another way, I guess, of him in his mind saying, if I get hit with unforeseen circumstances then you know i'm still not gonna fire or lay off a bunch of people but if he's scared he'll fire one once again the question is fox does tony see fox as a potential bidder for aew in the future and i really care about the people here and i would you know i i would do anything i can uh to protect the jobs and the livelihood of the people that work here and that's a family business and that's the difference between a family business and a public company in a lot of ways. And not a, and not every family business has those principles, but we do. And that's just how I was raised. And uh, I have to say Fox? that I feel like there's not enough loyalty in the entertainment business where, yes, it, it's no secret and it, and it is a business. So we'll be up at, you know, at the end of 2024 and... I would love to stay at Warner Brothers Discovery forever. I think it's it's great for the fans to have wrestling on TBS and TNT. I do think there will be a lot of potential bidders. I think that what you just said would make, probably make a lot of sense, you know, in the future. But I don't. I also don't think it's uh, yeah for FS1. You're not getting on Fox, uh, right? Well, for did- me. To spec- Go well, I was just going to say it, we've just established here uh, a while back when we were reading the reports that Fox wasn't even technically making money on the deal they had for SmackDown, but they were, you know, it was a, for the lowered bar of ratings these days, it was a success in terms of getting viewers, but that was three times as many people as AEW gets on Wednesday night from a global company with 50 years fucking behind them. Does anybody think that Fox would say, well, we didn't get SmackDown and we got to have a wrestling program, so let's go to these guys and see if we can triple their audience they get on Wednesday nights on our network on Friday? Is that, do they have to have wrestling over at Fox or do they just say, well, let's go get another goddamn Gordon Ramsay show? Good question. Apparently, Gordon Ramsay's back out on the streets again. He's back, baby. Ten pounds heavier. One more quote here. I'm looking through Jace's notes. Here's uh, Tony Khan a little earlier in the conversation. I don't even know what he's answering here. Uh, And right now, I feel like we've never been more organized. There have been some challenges and continue to be some things that pop up along the way. But the quality of the show has never been stronger. And that's that look, it happens in football, too. You have players get injured and nobody has it. You, you have to go out and play the next play. You have to go out and play uh, the next quarter, the next half, the next game, and the rest of the season, sometimes without these players. And, uh, you know, you have to – you have a game plan. Nobody feels bad for you that your game plan got knocked off script because some of the players got knocked out of the game. You just have to keep going with whatever script you can put together. And I think that's true whether it's in football or wrestling. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very, uh, very happy with what we're was doing scripted. right now. So without uh, completely uh, – Spilling the beans on everything I'm working on or, or everything I see for the future, I do think uh, it is really uh, going to be the start of a, a new era of what we're doing with AEW, and I'm very excited about that. Thanks, Bill. Well, let's stop it there. Uh, again, Thanks, guys. Everything's about this pay-per-view being the beginning of a new era, the end of a another era. I don't know what era. It's a celebration of Anoki, I thought. It's, I guess the end of the Anoki era, officially. And the start of the Paleozoic era. Or is it the Mesozoic era? What do you think in general? I mean, Tony comes across, I think, a little better when you don't have to watch him do it, when you're just listening. Yeah, but it's still, it's a it's an assault of verbiage that, uh, yes, the promoter is supposed to try at every instance to talk up 
his product to gloss over any weaknesses, uh, obfuscate hard question answers, etc. But it's just an endless stream of I'm great, you're great, we're all great, and this and that. And he, and he, he uses about three times as many words as he needs to in those situations. He's not doing a morning radio show. He's doing a media thing, answering questions, and not answering any of the questions. But the longer he goes, the more time you have to think, well, fuck, he didn't say a goddamn thing about what we asked him. No, that's the thing. He never... He usually only has his message that he wants to get out there during these things. He never answers anything that really gives you any insight. That comes from everything and, else. And that's the thing. If he would, if he would use a third of, of the amount of words, he wouldn't say the same message he's prepared three or four or five times over the course of the interview, which is what makes it stand out to you that he always goes back to saying the same basic thing. It's all great. We're going to have a great show. We've had a bunch of great shows and these guys are great and we're great. Well, Jim, perhaps someone's going to purchase Wrestle Dream and think, what the hell? This seems like the same old era, the same old con. Uh, Tony Khan, not con as in con artist. Tony Khan's at it again. I need the sue. Well, you know, if somebody needed to do that, then I don't think anybody knows the number that they need to call. Stephen P. News. If you need to see an outlaw mud show or two, still to the rest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, even though Stephen P. knew. At newlawoffice.com, the consigliere of the cult of Cornette, one of the most successful attorneys at law practicing today. Hell with practice, and he's so good at it, he don't need to practice. But he's got the most famous phone number in all of phone numbers, and he just changed it. Because he's got a brand new phone number that is even better, that's going to be on the tip of everybody's tongue, that's going to be coming from everybody's lips, that's going to be emitted from everybody's orifices. It's 877 50 Steve. S T E V E. 877 50 Hawaii 50 Steve. That's the new number to call for the 50 Steve. 50 Steve. <laughs> it's Steve McGarrett, see? But it's Steve New because they're remaking Hawaii 50 and Stephen P. New is going to be the star. Hook them, Dano. But there's, they're switching from Honolulu to Beckley. And, uh, well, let me just say the beach in Hawaii is going to look a little bit different on this series these days. But they've been trucking in sand from over in Virginia all week long for this. But yes, the incomparable, the illustrious, the incredible, the famous, the redoubtable, the infamous Stephen P. New, new phone number if you need to call him because you've been wrongfully terminated injured let's say you've been killed and you want to call somebody about it call stephen p new at newlawoffice.com at 877 50 steve well i think the better way to remember it is with the actual numbers 507 8383 no that doesn't matter how are you going to remember all those numbers like that remember this is this is human beings we're talking about. Most human beings can't remember seven numbers just at random. 50 Steve is much better than 507-8383 or 8383. You got a thing in terms of jingles. 877-50-STEVE! 877-507-8383! All right, how about 877-50? 50 Steve 877 <laughs> I'm just doing different voices now. Uh hold on, let me uh Nope, I'm not feeling it there. Um well we will we will go back to more jingles with this next week. Call the now... lawyer who call the lawyer whose name's in his number. 
Call the lawyer whose name no, is call one eight seven seven five zero seven Steve or whatever the fuck it is. Whatever the fuck it is, isn't that the Tom no, Drexler yeah, song? Leave out the seven. Well, yeah, but it's a jingle. Call one eight seven seven fifty Steve. Eight seven seven five zero seven eight three eight three. You do a more angry commercial. Well, Eddie, because you're the not people are be- angry. They're getting ripped off. Yeah, but you're, they're not angry anymore because Stephen P. New is getting them paid. So they're 877 steve Maybe it could be a battle between the angry who haven't been paid yet and the people who have already gone to trial and they've won. I don't know why we would have Steve's clients fighting each other in the commercial. But... Try cuatro twi, try cinco cinco uno. There used to be a fucking... Spanish language television program on at 5.30 in the morning on Channel 4 at a Bloomington, Indianapolis. And if I was up late enough, because I didn't get up that early, after watching the all-night creature feature movies and Bruiser's TV show and related material, that would be on. And they would always give the phone number like, Tre, cuatro, tre, cinco, cinco, uno. Well, this is 877 cinco zero. Steve-O. So, hi-ho, Steve Arino. Well, not Steve-O. This is Steve New. Well, no, Olson Oski, that would have been an entire international phone call if you had a number for each of the letters of Olson Oski. Was he any good? As a wrestler, yes. They tried him out as an announcer when he had a hand injury, and he wasn't a natural at that. But as a wrestler, he was pretty good. Was he like the early 80s Tom Zink? <laughs> no, no, he didn't have the body of zinc, but he also uh, had a little bit better wrestling talent. Of course, I couldn't beat him. He was a pretty good wrestler. I wrestled Steve-O. Me and Jimmy Hart in a handicap match. I what's, think what's Steve-O that was... It was a spot show, and that if me and Jimmy Hart were both on a spot show, when Lawler was booking, he would put us against a baby face in a handicap match. We wrestled... Bobby Eaton, Terry Taylor, Coco Ware, Steve-O, goddamn, I'm trying to, Lawler himself, Dundee, pretty much every baby face in the territory. Never won, but the once. We beat Bobby Eaton in Memphis and with, to throw the, so they didn't have to throw the money out, and then we, I got knocked out for real because of that, but I've told that story, and I'm digressing. Yeah, one day we got to play the audio from Lance on the air. Hey, never run in the ring, friends. No, yeah, that's one thing we got to <laughs> tell you, folks. Never get in the ring. That's not going to end well. For Cornette, who was laying there unconscious. And if anything happens to you, once again, Stephen P. New. I should have called Stephen P. New when the fan knocked me out. He would have got surveillance footage. That's right. Well, we'll have more with Stephen P. New. Surveillance and his... footage from 1980 fucking two in the Mid-South Coliseum was Pat Malone in the back with a fucking notepad drawing pictures with a pencil. Yeah, I think the camera we saw was the surveillance view. The yeah, one all of a sudden the went to the floor. the camera over. He, he was laying on the floor being trampled. Can you imagine uh, subpoenaing that footage? Well, we, we don't have that footage. The cameraman was the victim of a stampede. How did no one run off with the camera? They didn't care about the camera. They wanted the cash. The camera was too big to carry. Do you think you were punched in the face because the fan hated you and they wanted to punch you? Or were they there for the cash and like, oh, there's Cornette. I'm going to get him. Bingo. Yeah, no, they weren't coming directly for me. But while there was so much chaos, there was 40 people in the fucking ring. And I'm trying to hide behind one of the assassins. It came from beside me from the blind side on my left side of my jaw. At least that's what hurt when I woke up. So I never saw it coming. You know, it's been a long time, and we have a lot of new listeners. You want to tell the story? Oh, God damn it. So, real quick, one of Lawler's bright ideas when he was booking was to put me and Bobby and, and Jimmy Hart in a handicap match against Bobby Eaton, but because we always lost handicap matches, that wasn't anything new. But he wanted to try to make it an attraction, so <laughs> basically Bobby had, uh, or we had vowed that if we didn't win the match that we would throw, I think the amount he said was $5,000 out to the crowd in cash, right? And that was an old Tennessee stipulation going back to Goulas and Welch in the 60s. But it would like, back then it was, they'll throw $500 in cash to the crowd if they win or if they lose. But anyway, so before the match, 
we go in to get the finish, and Lawler says, okay, one of the assassins, Roger Smith, is going to be out there, and he's going to basically, you know, headbutt, loaded headbutt Bobby and allow us to, to win so we don't have to throw the money out, right? But we had the box sitting there at ringside, the box of supposed $5,000, and what Lawler did was he sent like a a $100 bill and two fucking 20s to the box office and got almost 150 ones. And he said, look, just crumple them up so they take up more space. And we less than $200 in ones was crumpled up in this big cardboard box that we had to prove we had this money. And so we have the match and we beat Bobby because the assassin interferes. And then I'm supposed to slide out, get the box off the ringside table, bring it in, and hand it back to Jimmy Hart. And we're just celebrating. But when Bobby Eaton wakes up and realizes he's been done dirty, he comes over and he pickles Jimmy Hart, and he pickles me and he grabs the box. And now Lawler told him, said, throw about two handfuls out. Just go to the ropes and throw a handful or two. And then... Roger's going to get back on you because don't throw too much of my money out, right? So Bobby grabs the box and he reaches in and he comes out with one handful and throws it over the top rope. Just, you can't throw a dollar 12 feet to the front row, right? He just throws some dollar bills in the air. And he reaches in and grabs another handful and throws the second handful out. And by the time he does that, Every little kid under the age of 10 in the Coliseum is scampering under the goddamn rope around the ring. And then it looks like every male under the age of 16. And they're coming. And then here comes some adults. And with the, he didn't even have time to throw three out before they're diving into the ring. The floor camera is shooting the match. And Ken Parnell was the guy's name. He worked for Channel 5 for a while also. They swamped him. They knocked him over and the fucking camera cuts off and he's on the ground. And the last that I'm trying to hide behind Roger Smith because he was 320 pounds and I look over and Jimmy's all by himself and people are going after what they perceive to be these, you know, $100 bills. And he's just, they're going all around him. I said, Jimmy, come over here and hide with me behind Roger. And that's the last thing I remember. There was 40 people in the fucking ring and all this chaos going on. The next thing that I knew, I'm sitting on my ass in the middle of the ring, which is completely empty, except for Roger and Jimmy leaning over me going, get up, Jim, you fainted. I'm like, what? You must have fainted. You got scared and you fainted. I said, if I fainted, why does my fucking jaw hurt? And Ken Parnell's the one, he said, as I was going over sideways, he said, I looked up, I saw somebody hit you somehow. And, but by the, once that they, the box, not only was all the money gone, but the box was gone. Everything, it was like it had been devoured by rabid tigers. But in the time that I got pickled and went down, they got all the money and the cops and Lance was waving everybody out, and they all dived out of the ring because they didn't want to get kicked out and get to see the rest of the matches, and all the money was gone. That was the last match on the show? No, they wanted to see the rest of That's what I'm saying. They didn't want to get right. kicked out. They wanted to see the rest of the matches. So they, when all the money was gone and they were, people were telling them, get out of the ring, they got out of the ring. I guess whenever you told the story, I always imagined you waking up in the empty arena, like in the middle of the ring. No, and- no, <laughs> it was an empty ring. <laughs> it went from fucking full like a battle royal to where'd everybody go and I'm staring at my fucking shoes. But no, I couldn't chew for three days. So if I did get scared and faint, I fainted directly on the left side of my face. All right. Well, that was the uh, famous fainting on the left side of the face story here on the show. There you go. Well, let's see. And now we'll do the the famous <laughs> motor oil bit. Jim, here's a question from the Cult of Cornet sent in on Facebook, the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. Chris Younger, Jim has said before, if WWE's main babyface had not been Hogan, it would have been Dusty Rhodes. Who would have been the main heel if not Roddy Piper? Well, and now let's clarify, it's not that I said that, it's that 
Vince is basically yeah, a, a Vince number of people it. have said that. Vince said it to Brian Solomon. Right. And we repeated the story. Um, good question there. If not Piper, Orndorff was tremendous, but he wasn't the, the promo that Piper was. Um, who, who was there at that point in time that seems like a lead guy? Cause again, Bob Orton Jr. Was in the group with Piper, but that, he wouldn't have been the guy by himself, even though he was the best worker of the bunch. Yeah. And again, um, you're not just talking about top heel. You're talking about because of when it was a top heel that could cross over a top heel. Hogan right. needed Piper for Hogan to be Piper. If it had been Hogan feuding with Nikolai Volkov, MTV wouldn't have been as big a thing. Piper was no, the perfect heel yeah, for that. It, it would have got three minutes on MTV. Oh, look, the Russian is being conquered by the American hero. That's great. And now onto the next thing. But Piper was a personality. You would have had to have had, and I mean, he, he was almost unique in the business with that personality that he had. And, um, I, you know, God. Well, if we look at who was on the roster, just on that. And again, if there's no Piper, you have to think someone from the outside may have been in there. Yeah. But who was there? David Schultz had been fired a few months earlier. Paul Orndorff, Bob Orton Jr., Big John Studd, now with Bobby Heenan in early 85, Nikolai Volkov and the Iron Sheik, Greg the Hammer Valentine, Brutus Beefcake, Yeah. Adonis and Murdoch were Adonis was still there, but that was kind of the end of their tag team. But Adonis would get repackaged, obviously. I mean, there are more names. None, than none of those people jump out at you at somebody that as somebody that MTV would have featured as somebody that could be the the foil of not only Hulk Hogan but also of of Cindy Lauper. That would would that have been a spot? They probably could have got him at that point. All I don't know, but I don't think so. But would that have been a spot for a heel Ric Flair? I don't know. Just I don't know how he would have fit in with the rock and wrestling. As a top heel, it works in 84, 85. Yeah, but I'm just thinking personality for mainstream television, but it was different then. And that, you know, still, no, I don't think. Hey, of course, they ended up flaming out quickly. And who knows if they had stayed after the summer of 84, maybe they had already turned heel by early 85, and there's the perfect thing. But Cindy Lauper started managing with David Wolf the Freebirds when they came in. <sighs> Michael Hayes, in terms of who could replace Roddy Piper as that kind of personality of the moment, Michael Hayes is one of the best, again, personal issues aside, one of the best bets of all the guys out there. Well, but... <sighs> He could have talked it, but he couldn't work it. Piper was, That's you know, true. head and shoulders above Michael as a single in 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 the ring, and but that's why you need Gordy. But then, but then you, but then you're you're opposing Hulk Hogan and unless you make Michael a, specifically a manager, and and is Mister T. So you're talking about someone who has to be able to interact with Mister T at that level. Well, but that was for the that was for WrestleMania, but I'm talking about the rivalry, the the money that Hogan and Piper drew against each other in the ring, not just the WrestleMania tag match. And the promos that were cut back and forth and et cetera was an integral part of getting Hogan over because Piper was so strong. And remember, Vince wasn't sold on him because of his size to the point where he was kind of a player coach, a manager wrestler at various points until he was able to be himself fully and get over. But Michael wouldn't have worked in the ring against Hogan whatsoever. Gordy would have, but then Michael is reduced to just the manager. And then it's, it, 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 it doesn't have the same dynamic. Roddy Piper was in the fans eyes at that point, the second biggest star in the company in the W and the second biggest star in wrestling for a lot of people next to only Hulk Hogan himself. So you got to replace that. All right. So looking at some of the options in other territories, Ted DiBiase probably wouldn't work there. No. 
Midnight Express, no disrespect. No. Obviously wouldn't work in that spot at that moment. Flair wasn't a heel. You said Flair. Flair wasn't a heel. When I said Flair as a heel, the heel Ric Flair, would that have been something that it... it they blew the dream matches years later between Hogan and Flair anyway, so would that have just, you know... Well, here's an interesting one. Again, just that, all the heels that are out there at that moment. Road Warriors. Two of them. Two, well, again, two of them, that's true. Come on, you were working. Other top heels. I'm telling well, that just shows you how valuable Piper was. There were a lot of top heels, but who could do what Piper did in that position? Who would be a, a wrestler believable to beat anybody from Hogan on down? The promo to incite the wrestling fans, but the personality in the promo to also get MTV to say, yeah, we need more of this guy, which are two completely different wheelhouses. And the fact that he kept it going and had the knowledge behind the scenes and the knowledge of the wrestling business to avoid get, ever getting beat by Hogan just to keep the heat to where he could come in and out pretty much when he wanted to. Hey, who else is going to do that? It's a good question, too, because everyone always says, if not Hogan, who? And you go right to Dusty or Kerry Von Erich. I mean, everyone has different ideas of who could have worked at least temporarily. It would have been easier to, at least short-term, replace Hulk Hogan than it would have to replace Roddy Piper at all. Well, Jim, let's get another question here from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group. This one was sent by no one. I'm not going to use that one. Hold <laughs> on. Let me go up here a little. I can't ask you a question about talent I know you haven't seen. Marcus Rose would like to know, would Nick Bockwinkle have been a good NWA champion? Oh, God, yes. Uh, short version. And... Uh, uh, some people may say, well, after Flair, you know, you needed the, the champion needed to be more flamboyant or more colorful, but that was pretty much the end of Nick's career by the time that Flair had a lock on it in the mid-80s. Nick Bockwinkle, in my opinion, was every bit as talented and excellent in every way, in-ring, work, psychology, uh, his promos, his demeanor, the whole nine yards, as Harley or Dory or Terry in his own way, completely different individuals, or any of the other, Pat O'Connor, any of your NWA champions from, you know, the, the, the mid-50s, from, from Thez, who was completely different, but from Thez on to Flair, Bockwinkle was as good in the ring and on the microphone as pretty much, and if it, Terry had such a longer career and worked different styles in different eras, but when he was NWA champion, Bockwinkle in his prime, his work was as good as what Terry's was defending the NWA title. Nick was very underrated by a lot of people today because by the time that what early 80s video came along and and Bockwinkle is tearing the house down with Lawler in Memphis his matches at that point were better than they were in the AWA because Lawler was a better opponent and honestly you know uh, they they meshed uh, that's why Nick said that Lawler was the best ring general he'd been in the ring with as far as calling something for his people his crowd in Memphis and that territory but Bockwinkle was already almost 50 by that point, and he was still performing at a high level, but in the 70s, you know, he was one of the best in the business. So he would have been a good NWA champion when? At, al at almost any juncture, had they decided to pull the trigger on it, he didn't, he didn't have the, he didn't have the Funk family lobbying for him or Fritz Von Erich at his corner. He didn't have any of the major NWA promoters you know, lobbying for him because he had never been, he'd been featured as a main event babyface in a variety of places, Georgia in the 60s and Southern California and various places, but he'd never been a heel until he went to work for Vern in 1970. He'd been wrestling almost 20 years. And when Vern made him the, the intellectual wrestling 
heal with the big vocabulary and the condescending manner from that point. I mean, he and Stevens were the best tag team in the world in the ring. He was a perennial AWA champion, but he, you know, he worked with a, a more limited pool of talent there because Vern either liked himself and Vern was over the hill at that point or the gimmick baby faces like Crusher and Mad Dog Vashon. So when Bockwinkle got in the ring with a younger guy that could fucking go and could work, he could tear the house down. But a lot of the AWA matches and then the stuff that survives on video besides of him in Memphis, is, you know, is not indicative. He went to Japan a number of... Remember that there was a Bockwinkle Ricky Steamboat match for Baba at one point, and that was, wow, we never see that in the United States. But I think Bockwinkle was fucking tremendous. Just so good. All right, Jim, I'm going to ask you about one just because enough people have sent it in, and it sounds ridiculous on its face, but I have heard <laughs> the rumor before, and for some reason, dozens of listeners have sent in questions about this. What do you know about the rumor that Rick Rude had his penis amputated, leading him to possibly take his own life? Are you on the fucking marijuana pills again, boy? Well, it sounds like you may not be aware of this story. Are you, are, you're seriously trying to make me believe that a dozen people or more sent that in as, as is this true or not? Yes. Do you think it is a, a conspiracy amongst these people to get us to fucking spread ridiculous information? Well, apparently it was spread by other people. The Honky Tonk Man has commented on it in the past, and then a few other wrestlers came No, Honky, Honky was not in support of that theory, was he? Honky Tonk Man and Ken Patera both stated that they heard years ago the same story, that Rick oh, Rude God. had apparently what? attempted to inject Viagra directly into his penis, <sighs> causing some sort of penile infection, which would lead to amputation, and he couldn't I, I, live without his penis. I was going to say, when, when you said he amputated his penis, I'm like, accidentally? He didn't mean to do it? What the fuck? Well, no, it was done for him. He didn't, uh, according to the story, allegedly. No. Uh, in a medical setting. For one thing, I don't think Viagra is uh, injectionable. Is it? It might be objectionable, but is it injectionable? I don't believe so, but it was a new drug at that time, and a lot of people who may have been used to using syringes for various kind of drugs may have wanted to experiment. Well, now, the story from Hollywood uh, gadabout reporter James Bacon was that when Marilyn Monroe was living rent-free in the guest house of... Who was the old man that was head of the studio? Was it Nick Skink or Joseph Skink? They Joseph. were brothers. Joseph. He apparently was keeping her there on the theory that she'd be right down the hill from his main house because he had to, this was back in the 50s, he had to hypodermically inject some solution that would inflate him artificially for a set period of time. And they said that whenever he'd take the shot and call for her, she'd diddle around and fucking take too long so he'd already be fucking back down in the in the in the deflation era where he started by the time she got there but i don't think that's a modern thing that was going on in the 80s no rick flair didn't have his fucking dick cut or rick no no right i'm not saying you're now just co going completely off script rick no. rude didn't have his dick cut off is what i'm saying to you you've never heard this story before i've never heard a thing like that in my life is it something that if it had happened you think you would have heard it one would think one would have heard that, and also, it, it, if it sounds that preposterous, chances are it probably is. All right, well, there's, uh, for everyone who's been sending in these questions about Rick Rude's penis, I hope this satisfies but it, you. But it did have anti-disestablishmentarianism tattooed on it on the side. Well, that cannot be confirmed nor denied here today, but uh, Jim, a couple other questions and we'll get the hell out of here. Because we can't end on the Rick Rude penis story. <laughs> we, can't, we can't end on Rude's disattached penis? I would like to know... Uh, this is uh, from the Cult of Cornet Facebook group by Ben Morrow. I would like to know... I would love to know, excuse me, 
what the boys that Jim was on the road with back in the day liked to eat. What? This is worded oh, in such a weird way. What? That is certainly some <laughs> tortured and strangled and mangled syntax, but... What was Dennis and Bobby's favorite road snack? Well, here's that what we would do normally is we would leave during noontime or during the early afternoon to go to the town and we would stop at a fast food place that we would, depending on where we were going, we might have one that was on the way or we might just stop at what we encountered. But I've, I've always been a Wendy's guy, but also back in those days, Hardee's was not bad. And we used to do a little Hardee's. Um, McDonald's was a thing. KFC, especially when they had nuggets. Nuggets, easy to eat in the car. So it would depend. It would be a mutual agreement of these things. But it was always fast food. You didn't have time to go in and sit down somewhere. Every once in a while, like I mentioned the other day, when we'd go to New Orleans, there'd be a van full of us. We'd stop at a Sizzler for the steak and all-you-can-eat shrimp. That was a go-in type of thing, but it didn't take forever. There was a a restaurant in between Oak City and Tulsa that if we were on middle of the card in Oak City and got out early enough, we could afford to take an hour to stop and sit down and eat, which was wonderful since it was not only cooked to order food, but also we were in the middle of a fucking thousand mile, 48 hour loop in a car. But most time it was fast food. And then when we get out of the show at night, that's where Bobby and Dennis were wanting to go for uh, straight to the liquor store. A lot of times they didn't even eat. Stan didn't drink to the uh, level that Bobby and Dennis did together at that time, especially in Mid-South Wrestling. So Stan would eat. But most time, as long as we went to the liquor store and got their beer and I'm driving anyway, then I could pick whatever the fuck food-wise that we were going to do afterwards. But again, it was a drive through window. Because and and if if you could find one open, I've mentioned that sometimes we had gas station fucking sausage, because there was nothing else available at midnight forty years ago, you know, in in a lot of these places. And so it it would just depend, but it would always be with an eye toward uh, let's get the quickest food we possibly can and get the fuck out of here. And because we always late and always got to be somewhere. But I mean, we had fun there too. Like, you know, going up to all these drive throughs especially in the Carolinas, people would know who the fuck we were when they saw us and the reactions sometimes would be amusing. Or, you know, I told you the thing that Bobby did that one time. We're at Wendy's and all the fucking kids work in the Wendy's window they recognize us can we have your autograph and they hand out the pen and paper so I sign it hand Stan he signs it hand back seat to Bobby he writes something hands it back to me as I'm handing it to them I see that he's written please help me call police you know and that was funnier when I saw it than when I just told it I guess imagine if people had cell phones oh and it, well, they, then they would have been diving in the car with us to take pictures though that was the thing, was, you know, so, but, but yes, that was the food of choice was anything that we could get as quickly as possible because we were in the middle of a two or three or four or 500 mile fucking drive. I remember you telling a story about Dennis getting into an incident at like a 7-Eleven or a small store where... Oh, yeah. Fans. How many of those incidents or incidents like that happened in Mid-South where it was, it could have happened, but you quickly were able to either get out of there or just calm the situation? How many... Until you stop going into public, I guess I should say. How many of these kind of incidents were happening? Well, I mean, it didn't just happen to us. It happened to a variety of the boys. You'd hear one of the guys coming in telling a story. I had to punch a guy at the fucking gas station or whatever. But And this Dennis was alone because he had... I can't remember what the situation was, but he may have come from... You know, if we had a day off, he drove his little two-seater Corvette that he had and to the matches and was going, but he was by himself, goes into 7-Eleven and is getting some beer and the, some guy comes up, hey, what the fuck do you mean fucking doing that to the Rock and Roll Express on TV Saturday or whatever the fuck? And Dennis tries to blow him off and he hauls off and punches Dennis. And Dennis fucking backhanded him. He had to, all the guys got that gold jewelry. 
right? When they got to Mid-South, they're making, this is 40 years ago, two and $3,000 a week. Dog made 12000 one week. So they've all got these, Dr. Death had so much gold on him, I don't know if he'd have been able to get through a goddamn metal detector. Yeah, but that may have been from OU sponsors, to be fair. <laughs> no, I, I, saw him buy, I saw him buy a couple of them. He would, no, it was coming out of his pocket, too. Gold chains, gold bracelet of fucking inch thick, the goddamn gold coin rings. And so Dennis backhands the guy, and it broke his gold fucking wrist, or gold wrist, broke his gold <laughs> bracelet, the man with the golden wrist, a new yes. gimmick for Dennis Contra. <laughs> and he knocked the guy over amidst a uh, section of canned peas or whatever. And he grabs his bracelet up and he throws the fucking, because the guy at, behind the counter is calling the cops. So he throws him a hundred dollar bill, takes his fucking beer, takes his bracelet and gets the fuck out of there. Hop scar drives off. But it would, you know, it, Sometimes you'd get away from it, and other times there's been guys getting little scuffles. Well, you see that all the time when people on Twitter come up with the uh, the old newspaper clipping from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where, you know, some guy tried to goddamn smart off to one of the boys and got the shit kicked out of him. There was an article from the Charlotte Observer that it was on Twitter here not long ago, Wahoo!, Apparently, it, it, over at, near the South Park Mall, where a lot of the wrestlers used to go by there, live in that area, he'd been there, and I can't remember the particulars of how the confrontation started, but it was basically, there were three, it was a police report in the paper, there were three guys in a fucking car that had a interaction with Wahoo McDaniel, and we're being smart asses to him, apparently, because he stuck one of their heads in one of those fucking bicycle racks and they couldn't get it out. <laughs> and he punched in a whatever. I mean, shit like that would happen because everybody, uh, not everybody, but in a lot of cases, every territory had fans. They saw you out. They were going to have something to say. And either if it was the wrong day for you to say something to that person or that person just felt they needed to take up for the business or themselves, they would kick the shit out of that fucking person. And then you'd have a goddamn instant. And then guy get a lawsuit and he'd have to leave the fucking territory or whatever. All right, Jim, one last question before we get out of here. We'll get a song or two. Any thoughts on the news, the passing of wrestler Curtis Smith, former, I believe he was one of the Infernos, the Inferno that replaced Frankie Kane, also the Blue Yankee. Oh my God, how old was he? Uh, let me see. Easily 80. That. I did not know. I didn't know that he had passed away, but Curtis Smith was, yes, as you mentioned, a mighty Yankee and one of the Infernos in the, uh, the, the, obviously the Infernos with JC Dykes as their manager were the most, 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 most well-known uh, set of Infernos. And Mephisto, Frankie Kane was involved, as well as Curtis Smith. And who was the goddamn... There was another one. Rocky Smith was his brother. Rocky was his brother. And, uh, but Curtis Smith, that, you know, he would have had to, I would think, now be in his 80s at least, would he not? I would think. I'm not actually finding an age. Scott Teal announced okay. it on uh, Facebook. That's where I saw it. Well, if and Scott, being 97 years old on his own, he's been around for everything. That's not when, what I was saying, no. When he was in school, they didn't have history. Again, we're not um, here to make fun of Scott Teal. We're here to... But, any, do you remember, the, yes. when was the first time you saw J.C. Dykes in the Infernos? Well, see, here's the thing. It was so fucking early on, I was not smart in any way. I don't even know if that's one of the sets that was <laughs> Curtis Smith was in. But the Infernos were a mass tag team that not only J.C. Dykes was a manager most of the time, but they had other managers, but... And sometimes they just worked as themselves. And by the way, he joined in 71. Frankie Kane was already gone by that point. So 71. Okay, there you go. Because that's when Frankie Kane became the great Mephisto. But a part of the hallmark of the Infernos was by the name they threw fire like the Sheik. And or sometimes the manager would throw the, you know, the Kane through the fire or whatever. And also, as you'll recall, Mephisto, Frankie Kane used a built-up boot, a loaded boot, right? One of the Infernos at one point, I think, was it in the Florida or Georgia territories, was known as Clubfoot Inferno. I love and that they, name. One of my favorite names ever yes, for a wrestler. 
because they did the deal where the, his one leg was shorter than the other was the story, which is why he medically had to have the built-up boot on one foot where the sole was obviously thicker than the other foot. It was obvious also because it was bright white. It was highlighted <laughs> so that you could see it. And he used the loaded boot whenever they were in trouble. He'd kick the fucking toe of the boot on the goddamn mat a couple of times to load it and everybody would see it. And then you'd kick the guy and he's out. And then he would tap the heel to unload it. And that was, so they used a variety of standard wrestling heat getting gimmicks, but it was all combined in their, their whole presentation. They were a masked heel team, but there was a loaded boot involved sometimes. And sometimes they threw fire. And sometimes they switched places because they were wearing identical masks and outfits. And so there was all, and they had a manager that talked a bunch of bullshit. So teams like that, and the, the mighty Yankees were uh, another team that had multiple members. At one point, Charlie Fulton and Frank Morrell were the mighty Yankees and managed by George Bunk Harris. But there were tons of them. And Actually, in Memphis in 1967, they had a team of Blue Infernos because the regular Infernos had already been there. So the Blue Infernos were, it was Gypsy Joe and goddamn, who was the other one? Was it, it might have been Frank Hester, I'm not sure. He was one of the dominoes later on. But they had a big sellout run in Memphis at the old Ellis Auditorium with Jackie and Roughhouse Fargo where they sold out like, eight or ten weeks in a row in the summer of 1967. But that was a standard, old-fashioned, southern heel team type of presentation. One guy's got a boot, they throw fire, they've got masks on, they got the manager that interferes. You, you, they could get stabbed or cut in any fucking town in 15 minutes, the Infernos. They had so much heat. Well, Jim, with that, the drive through is closed. In a very pleasant way. Let me put this down. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh, we'll oh be, shit has been called. We'll be back in a few days on the Jim Cornette Experience, wherever you find your favorite podcast. And, of course, the Jim Cornette, the Jim Cornette Drive-Thru. Jim Cornette's Drive-Thru next week. Also, wherever you find your favorite podcast, go through the archives, patreon.com slash Cornette. $5 a month. Get you access to the archive going back to 2013. Patreon.com slash Cornette. Don't forget about the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Jim Cornette. It'll come right up. Full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections, all with the very popular Travis Heckle artwork. The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. Follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. Follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. Hear me on the 605 Super Podcast. And of course, don't forget about the Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcast or from TheWrestlingNews.com directly. Every day, your free daily wrestling newscast, The Wrestling News. Cornette's Collectibles at JimCornette.com. What's going on, Jim? October 7th at noon, JimCornette.com. Get your complete Christmas list. All your shopping taken care of. One place. Impress your friends. Alienate your family. Do me some good. And after Jim sends you a package of nothing, you may want to sue. Call Stephen Pinu with his new phone number. I don't have it in front of. Is eight, it eight 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 seven eight, seven, seven fifty Steve five zero oh, seven eight three eight three? That's another way to say it. Get even with Stephen. Newlawoffice dot com, and that's it. We'll be back on the experience, and next week here on the drive through for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Thank you, Jace, for your hard work. Tally ho!